All right, welcome into the deeper dive on Saturday afternoon, evening, wherever you are. We appreciate you hanging with us. We're going to roll right into live before lock, so no need to go anywhere. Right up until this 10-game slate locks, we have you covered for the next long time right now to do the math in my head. I wasn't asked to do all that math in my head, Steve Buzzard. It is a pleasure and honor for the first time you and I get to do a show together. We have a lot to look at to go game by game deep into everything mike is in the house producing tell you about prize picks as well as far as what you can get out of that and again any questions you have for steve regarding this slate hit them up in the chat all we ask in return thumbs up subscribe what's happening man hey super pumped to, to be out here first time doing uh one of the deeper dives this year i've done a few of them uh last year but uh great to have a chance to get out here hang out with guys on uh, a saturday afternoon which I, I love the Saturday and Sunday uh, slates during NFL season because a lot of people are just paying attention to NFL and you can really take advantage of it. So glad to be here. And I was, was just talking uh, before beforehand. I think there's a little bit of run, run good going on of uh, getting on the show because uh, yeah. I had a nice win last night uh, following after Adam's footsteps. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can get some, some for someone else here in uh, chat today. Fantastic. Anybody who can get a W, we, we hope, of course, that we can spread the love by all means. But yes, anybody who can get the W right around Halloween as well. I'm sure it sounds like your household much fuller than mine. This is the first time for me in my life that I'm responsible for dressing somebody else in a costume. But you're a veteran at that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking forward to that tomorrow. So that's yeah, that's a good point. That'll make it even more uh, uh, hectic here for folks uh, tonight. But uh, yeah, we'll go out, do some trigger treating. I think I'll uh, go as uh, the Luigi to to my little guy's Mario. So oh, nice. should be fun. Yeah, see, mine's four months. I can't really combine <laughs> anything. Maybe like a Dr. Evil and a Mini-Me. I get that a lot. <laughs> that Perfect. That's awesome. At Steve Buzzard on Twitter, at Shander Show for me. We'll bounce around and go through this slate game by game, look at everything we can from an injury concern standpoint. We'll use all of the tools and metrics available for us on Osimo as well. And, and let's start with the magic in Detroit. Pistons looking, of course, for their first win. Hasn't been great on the other end as well from a team standpoint with Orlando. But if we look at ownership at least Cade Cunningham right there at the top much cheaper of an option to start the season is that where you start is there another area to really jump in this game ahead of time yeah if we look at Detroit um, specifically uh, Cunningham I think it's pretty interesting uh, there's a lot of uncertainty on how much he's going to play today his first game uh, you know this whole season they've been very cautious with him I would expect that they're going to limit his minutes at least somewhat I'm projecting him to have around 26 minutes which on FanDuel and Yahoo the, where they priced him that's going to be pretty tough to get to him but on DraftKings at 3600 I think that's a really good spot for him to be in uh, and I think you're going to have to take some shots because he could certainly go well over that 26 you know minutes they might have just been holding him back and saying hey we're waiting until he's 100 percent ready to go or they could just really limit his minutes so I think there's a lot of ways that they can go there uh, and then with the way that they're going to spread out the rest of their minutes, I think is also pretty interesting. You know, Killian Hayes was a, is a big part of their plans long-term. I have to think still. Uh, so I have to believe that they're still going to get him a quite a few minutes and maybe like cut Frank Jackson and Corey Joseph down a bit uh, in the rotation. So I, I think you can get some uh, Killian Hayes as well uh, in there in that backcourt. Uh, so I think both of those are, you know, interesting plays, but I think it's going to be pretty interesting with how Cunningham gets worked into the mix. I, I'm not really sure right now. And, and even how, how that translates to Jeremy Grant, because Jeremy Grant's price is, is really good as well on DraftKings, especially. So I think you could, uh, you could certainly take a chance with him. I mean, I'm never going to fault you anyone for, for doing that, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's going to be a different rotation and I'm, I'm excited to see how Cunningham looks in this, uh, this game. Uh, I mean, the Detroit kind of, you know, they, they tanked a whole season in order to get them. So hopefully he pays off. 
So the only thing I, I would look at in response to you, and it's a question to kind of follow up, would be the ownership. And he's the highest owned projected that we have tonight. Such a cheap option. He's everybody's cheap option. But you lay out some concerns. Is the combination of super high ownership and the lingering concerns you have as far as minutes and how often you can get to him tonight, is that more of a, a reason to pivot or maybe stay away and counter the ownership for some higher leverage? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, I, I would probably go under the field at looking at his ownership right now. Um, I think that that risk is just too high. Everyone is just super excited to, to play him. And he could come out and, like I said, he could come out and play all those full minutes. But when you get a, if you get somebody that is super high owned with a high amount of uncertainty, that's the type of guy that I want to go under the field. It could backfire. So I don't, I don't say fade him completely. But uh, yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Sadiq Bay, we've got Mo Bamba as well. Some mid price guys, if you will, on the slate to look at and maybe just more of taking advantage of somebody's got to score a couple of bad teams. Although Detroit is not a great scoring team as a whole. So you would really have to identify maybe one guy that you could finish above a projected um, as far as what we have, as well as their cost, either of those guys or anybody, Cole, Anthony, anybody at the top, as far as price from, from this game, Steve, that jumps out at you. Yeah, if, if we jump over to the Orlando side, um, I think that Orlando is actually pretty interesting across the board. Um, I think you could go to a lot of different spots. Mo Bamba is really good price on FanDuel in particular. I think he looks uh, really good there. He's not getting a ton of ownership, I don't think. Uh, I don't have that up right now, but no, I don't remember. actually, you're right. He's... Yeah, down right now. Last projected just before the show at 14.1 percent. Yeah, so I think that that's really good. A anytime you're playing against Detroit, I think that's a, a, pr a yeah. pretty good matchup. So I don't have a problem going with him. Cole Anthony also, I think, is a, is a really nice play. I don't think that he's someone you need to go way over the field on, but he is someone that I think looks like a, a pretty reasonable uh, play at his ownership as well. He's been getting quite a few more minutes this year than what he had been getting last year. So I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. The one that looks like he's coming in a little bit high owned is just another notch down on, on, um, on the salary is Wendell Carter. So it looks like yeah. we have him coming in here in the mid teens and ownership Our optimal ownership percentages on the boom bus tool say he should be closer to 8%. So normally that's a good indicator that he's someone that I'm not going to be super heavy on. So uh, of all the guys that are on this game, he might be one of the uh, bigger fades. He's, I mean, he's certainly capable of having a big game. And like I said, any of these Orlando guys are. So, so yeah, I think he might be probably one of the bigger fades from, from an ownership standpoint. Anybody, before we move to the Knicks Pelicans game, anybody else, you know, Franz Wagner, the homecoming that could be for Wagner, anybody there that we've left off that you want to hit on? Um, I think looks like on a fan duel, uh, Jalen Suggs also looks pretty good. So he's been getting in the, you know, in the mid 30 or no, just maybe just around 30 minutes for 4,600 as a point guard. I know his per minute output hasn't been outstanding this year, but it's been good enough. Uh, he looks like he's somewhere around, you know, 0.85 or so points per minute. And at 4,600, that's a, that's a pretty attempt appealing price right now unless we end up getting a lot of uh, value opening up later yeah i was looking uh, ownership i think would you get some pretty good leverage with that right We're balancing the cost and ownership with Suggs on fandle you mentioned yeah yeah i think so yeah. he he does look like he is going to be somewhat popular yep but uh i think that i i'm okay with that if you if you get a really cheap guy that has been fairly consistent then i think that that's a good place to go to if his ownership stays high and we get other good deals, maybe maybe it's time to pivot then. Let's start at the top with the Knicks and Pelicans game. We know still no, uh, as far as New Orleans, still dealing with injury there, obviously with Zion. But Randall, one of the top guys, not the top. We still have Giannis to talk about, Steph, and of course, Joel Embiid. Cat, just under the 10K on DraftKings. But Randall is hovering right there. So do you anticipate getting a lot 
to Julius Randle. Career high so far. It's early in assists. So even if the scoring is down, there's some other areas there for success. How often do you anticipate getting to Randle tonight? Yeah, I think you mentioned that like all those other guys that are at a similar price point makes it pretty hard to get to Randall for me. Uh, New Orleans isn't a great matchup by any means. And it just feels like if I'm going to be paying up, which is a little bit tough right now on the slate, to be honest, if, if, if we get some more value that opens up later uh, with some more news, then maybe I could get to Randall more. But if I'm looking at guys at similar price points, you know, like, like you said, Towns and Bede, I've got all those guys projected for a couple of extra points. And while Randall can, of course, blow up and, you know, just destroy the slate anytime, I'd rather take my chances with those guys uh, for about the same price point. I was looking too, and I, I think just overall from an ownership standpoint, he is super low compared to where just as far as, you know, the field is concerned we have him at 6.7% projected on DK. Does that entice you anymore? The fact that you look and, oh, well, you know what? He's super owned. It's not low owned. It's not like you're competing with other rosters that are also pivoting away from other guys that you mentioned from Steph and Giannis. Yep. Yeah. I think that that would be the biggest reason to do so because he's, he's not, a good play from a value standpoint, I don't think, but that, but that, uh, low, you know, low popularity for him, I think certainly makes him a, a viable option. Just not someone that I'm going to go to in, in probably too many of my lineups. So before we touch on the Pelicans and looking at the backcourt Fournier and maybe even Barrett, are you getting to any of these middle options? Walker had that resurgence against the Sixers. Are you getting to any of these mid cost options as much, especially looking at, the overall slate and maybe looking at not paying up as much for guys in the backcourt. Yeah. Um, I don't think a whole lot either here. It's just, everyone is priced pretty well and new Orleans isn't a, a great matchup for them. So I think, I'll, you know, if you can get, if you want to get a few shares of, you know, RJ Barrett, he's always, he's getting in a fair amount of, minutes and i think he's going to be pretty consistent his ownership is not very high and the same for like mitchell robinson but you know not someone that i'm going heavy on yeah by all means it makes sense just curious yep. to see if there was anybody that maybe you had that that was under the radar that you could yep. find out there now on the flip side the pelicans it's just injury after injury we know now yep. to add it to with brandon ingram tonight so how are you approaching this team especially knowing that even if guys are playing, it, it doesn't look like that you're going to get the, the consistent lineup that we've expected from New Orleans, and they've been struggling as a result. Yeah, New Orleans is one of the more interesting teams uh, for sure. So one, we had Ingram ruled out this morning. He hasn't missed a game yet this year. So there's a little bit of uncertainty from that standpoint on who's going to step up and take that role on. But then also we have Josh Hart. He came back. He played in the low twenties in minutes yesterday. Um, I'm not expecting him to, to play him much more than that. Again, I'm thinking with uh, back to back and that being his first game, they wanted to limit his minutes to see how he went. I uh, can't imagine them pushing him up a ton on this, on this back to back, you know, what, what's the point to, to do that. So you could potentially see him get a few more minutes, maybe 24, 25, even possibly if they really want to push him in the, in the upper twenties, but I don't think that they really have to. So they have, they have enough guys that, that that's the case. The other question then becomes who else will pick up a lot of the minutes like Najee Marshall. I think you could see getting a fair amount of extra minutes. His price is very cheap and I, I can't imagine him uh, picking up a ton of ownership. Also Trey Murphy could be in the rotation, Herbert Jones as well could be getting quite a few more minutes. I, I think actually, you know, you could really see him getting, let's see, I think I have him in the upper 20s in minutes. Yeah, in around 28 and a half minutes. So uh, the problem with uh, him is that he just doesn't produce a lot of points per minute. Yeah. So he doesn't give you nearly the upside as like uh, Najee Marshall, for instance. So so I think I think it's a really interesting spot. You could take a couple of shots on all of those different guys and not go super heavy on any of them because you know a couple of them are probably not going to do anything essentially, and there's probably going to be one or two of them that 
uh, exceed their expectations at those price points. I want to get your thoughts on Valanciunas because clearly the productivity is there. He is high on the ownership as far as what we have projected on DK, but at the same time, he's right below Jimmy Butler as far as being in the optimal lineup. The cost is a great pivot away from both Jokic, which I think is going to take a lot more convincing, as a, and also Embiid, which is not going to take any convincing from me here in Philadelphia to move <laughs> away from a guy playing still with a knee injury. But the ownership, it is a 10-game slate, Steve, so it's not like everybody at the top should be countered for leverage. If you can use it as a pivot as well, does he now become an appealing play based on how we have him projected in the optimal lineup and in the boom-bust tool on top of him being so workable at 8,100. Yeah, I, I think so. I think he is really nice play. Uh, his minutes are the most that he's gotten in the last few years. That's been really consistent here in the mid mid thirties. So it's really good to see him there. He's going to, I would have to imagine he's going to pick up a little bit of extra rebounds and a few more usage points here in this matchup without uh, Ingram as well. So that's a, a nice added bonus. Like you mentioned, he is going to be popular. But we do have him at about in the low 40s on percent of chance of boom and his optimal percentage in the uh, 15 range. So I think that those all look pretty reasonable to me for uh, for going for him. And I think I could I'll be overweight on him. All these tools available. Twenty nine ninety five a week. Awesome. O plus for your weekly pass. Everything that we have out there in the DFS world, use our code here and be a deeper dive. It's all one word. It's all caps. And you can jump in 25% off your first week of Awesome Plus Platinum. So you can hang with Steve. You can follow along what he's saying. And you can have in six other windows, as many windows as you want open, <laughs> all of the tools available to you. Hell, you can play six different sports at the same time while listening to Steve. That's fine. But take advantage of what we have. NBA Deeper Dive is the promo code we're going to give you 25 percent off your first week all right so anything more I, I think we've covered this game unless there's a punt or or maybe a lower cost option that you want to bring up even from a pivot standpoint on the slate uh i think that's it from the, from yeah. that game uh I, I was gonna say i think you're looking over my shoulder here at, with all my different uh tools up and that's my <laughs> everyday uh approach here at awesome oh, i got you know seven different tools i'm refreshing all the time for nba and all the ones for mlb and nfl we just got so much going on right now that i i think hopefully it doesn't slow my computer down here <laughs> that's amazing no it hasn't slowed anything down yet and no i'm not trying to read it through your eyeballs by any means <laughs> a safe assumption that you have a ton up by all means. All right, let's move to the Pacers and Raptors game. We know Sabonis at the top, still Raptors dealing without Siakam, and Brogdon looks like it's a no-go, right, as far as tonight is concerned. So we factor in injury. Let's start with the Raptors on the road first and foremost. And, you know, Van Vliet's going to be up there. We have him 8,100 on DK. And just to kind of look, not super high by any means when it comes to ownership. Starting at the top, are you getting to him or is there anything else that you're looking at? Maybe OG, who isn't really a higher price guy by any means. So I don't know if you're looking at much, to be honest, Steve, here with the Raptors. Yeah. Um, so Van Vliet has been interesting. I thought he would have really stepped up his scoring a little bit more this year without uh, Siakam and without uh, Lowry <laughs> as well. Right. Uh, so, but, but he hasn't really, that said, I, I think he, him not being that popular about 10%, I think is a, is a fair place to go to for him. I don't think I get super excited about that, but it is, I think a fair price. It, the one, the one guy who I think maybe has been, you know, capping him from getting up there and being quite so good as Scotty Barnes emergence. He's been a really nice uh, addition for the team getting in the mid thirties of, um, of minutes. I think that's a really nice start to the season. This, this rookie class has actually been really pretty good uh, all around. And, and maybe it's partially been just the, the, the light pricing on, on some of the sites, but you're getting good minutes from a lot of guys and, and 35 minutes in and at Yahoo for, for $20 for Scotty Barnes. I think that looks uh, like a really appealing price. He, he is going to be pretty popular over there. He looks like he's one of our, 
uh, more popular guys there, but I think that you can uh, you can figure out a way to fit him in uh, pretty easily. Yeah, same on Fandle, 6,200, 6,100, right? Or 6K, sorry, is in reference there. The cheaper option on DraftKings as well. How long do you think before the numbers kind of catch up? Do you, do you think this is a wave that, because they are young, and I don't know how much benefit of the doubt they're still going to get but at the same time it's not to say that they're not going to be these sites aren't going to be sharp and jump ahead of a wave as well yeah you gotta feel like at some point they're gonna start pricing up these uh young guys but clearly they haven't done it yet we see it again with uh cunningham today that we talked about earlier so uh so the nice thing is you you should be able to embrace kind of the variance, embrace the fact that people don't know these players as well, including me, right? All of us don't know them as well, unless you're big buffs on the college basketball front. But uh, yeah, so just be confident. We're doing a lot of analysis here at Osmo to make sure that we have the right, you know, type of production for the young guys and, you know, follow hopefully what our, what our projections are saying. As far as uh, at the top there, um, or I guess moving on right to Indianapolis and, and looking at this Pacers team here, Sabonis at 9,200. There is going to be some flexibility at the four five at the very least. Are you getting to a lot of him compared to ownership to the field? Yeah, I don't know about a whole lot of Sabonis that, he could get some extra run with uh, Brogdon being out, not not like in a minutes, but more from a usage standpoint, he could, he could get that. Um, so I think that that's a, a pretty good thing. He does look like he's getting some popularity though. So he's in the mid teens and his ownership uh, looks like across the board, except for Yahoo where he's really expensive. So, but uh, so I think you can get to him there. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty on how, the Pacers handled this Brogdon situation. And then they also have Lavert, who's questionable. Yep. Uh, I He keeps getting closer and closer to being able to return, but I kind of have a feeling he's going to sit again today. I, I don't have anything that tells me that is a, is a high probability one way or the other, but they held him out last night on a back-to-back. They knew they were playing without Brogdon. Uh, they didn't know for sure if Brogdon was going to play today at that point, I don't think. Uh, so I, I would have thought if they were going to play him today, they might have played him yesterday on the front end instead. Because you know what's what's one extra day? I don't think it's that 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 much. Even if he plays, I think he's going to be pretty limited. So without those guys, we saw um, T.J. McConnell play a lot of minutes last night. He got. 33 minutes actually without Brogdon. He wasn't very productive though. So he only had 22 points. I think that's going to hold some people off of McConnell, but we know in general uh, McConnell's played well in these situations before. So I don't have a problem giving uh, McConnell another shot. Hopefully his ownership will be a little bit lower. We're not projecting it necessarily low right now. No, it's super high. <laughs> <laughs> but, but again, it's uh, a big plate. So it's not like you're locked in and you know, 24% is still three quarters of anybody in, in, is not playing him. It's only a quarter overall. So it's not like it's burying you, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I wouldn't be too scared of that, that level. I think it might actually end up a little bit lower than that from the people that kind of got scared off from yesterday's poor performance. So I, I think that could be something to watch out for. And then I think you could get some other, you know, a little bit of interest from guys like Justin Holiday and Jeremy Lamb picking up potentially a little bit of extra uh, leverage against McConnell not being super popular and also getting uh, a potential extra few minutes here. 5,600 on DK for Duarte. Any interest there? Super low owned as well. Yeah, I think he makes a lot of sense. He's been getting really good minutes. Uh, another one of these young guys. Uh, I, I thought he was going to be getting a little bit of trouble with his minutes uh, with Levert coming back. Uh, but with Brogdon out, yep. uh, I think that makes him pretty safe. And if Levert is out as well, which, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get that information close to lock or or shortly thereafter. So pay attention for late swapping, but I think that uh, he would make a really good play in that sense too. All right. So we appreciate everybody popping in here by all means, please hit that thumbs up button. I know you have some questions here, so we'll do our best. The three of us, myself, Steve, Mike, 
to sift through and hit any question you have specifically for Steve. And also take advantage of what we have going on with Prize Picks. It's right above us. This is a great offer where you can sign up for prizepicks.com, play a ton of over under props in the NBA tonight based off of what we're talking about. You can then apply that to solid numbers. You can use the metrics and data available for you on Awesomeo to leverage against some plays. And we're going to match your first deposit up to $100. It's simplified for you. It's reduced for people like me who can just sign up over, under, and move on. <laughs> so if I can figure it out, I promise you can as well. To get $100 match is going to be insane. All right, my friend, let's keep it moving. A rematch of the Eastern Conference semifinals down in South Philadelphia. A lot of injury concerns slash just guys who aren't here anymore for the Philadelphia 76ers Hawks, of course, a little deeper and maybe even some leverage with Trey young as far as super low owned. Let's start with Atlanta and we can kind of go into Philadelphia and all the problems that they're having. Are you, <laughs> how, how on, it's, it's true. I'm here for any <laughs> issues. I promise. Uh, are, are you looking at 9,600? Not by any means the highest price, but you also have Steph on the slate. Uh, you look super low owned, so you can even be above the field and not get to a lot of Trey Young, right? Yeah, so we're having him, we're showing him at like 1%. Our optimal shows him at 2% on DraftKings, so that's really low on both sides. The thing that we know, though, about Trey Young is he can blow up any slate anytime. Uh, so I do think that anytime you can get him at 1%, I think you've got to really take that into consideration. Um, I'll probably, I'll, I'll be somewhat over that. I don't know that I'm going to go overboard on that, but uh, I mean, every game, I think that he's, he's going to have it. And I, and I think that this, and this matchup against Philly, uh, you know, irregardless of the issues that <laughs> the Philadelphia has been having, I, I think that these are two pretty good teams. And I think that they're going to come out and play and Trey Young will, will play pretty uh, aggressively on some of the other sites like uh, uh, FanDuel, he's unpopular. So I don't think he's, uh, I'll probably go with him as much there. And then on Yahoo, he's just uh, getting like no ownership. So you could certainly take some shots on him there. The rest of the guys, I, I don't know that I'm super excited, although I'm not sure wh why Clint Capella is way down at $24 on Yahoo. So uh. I think you, <laughs> I think you could go with him over there. Uh, that seems like a really low price and actually his ownership isn't even that that high either so that, that's kind of interesting to me but uh i think that's a reasonable spot and outside of that the, the, there isn't a whole lot on the atlanta team that i'm super excited about there really isn't much of a pivot option either as far as somebody in the mid level like john collins or even taking a risk at a 4500 on dk for deandre hunter it doesn't even seem like if we're looking at not a first option steve but a second a pivot away from other games and players we'll talk about for the rest of the slate doesn't even look like Atlanta is appealing in that regard. Yeah, not, not too much. I think Trey young would be the, would be like the perfect one for that. Cause he could get you away from some of the more popular uh, expensive guys, but yeah, in the middle range, I don't think that I even see anyone that stands out for, for that purpose or, or anyone that even has like, Hey, this is a big high variation on his minutes or something like that. It's just, yeah, I think they're just kind of are who they are right now. And we have to wait till they get some injuries. Right. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Let's flip to the other side here and just refreshing the ownership to see if it's changed much at all, which I didn't think it would jump significantly, but as, High of a cost as Joel Embiid is, I think it makes sense from a three and a half percent ownership projection on DK at least that people are, are maybe concerned or not willing to take a risk so much. There's also the matter of the matchup, which wasn't necessarily fantastic for a guy. Granted, he was hurt, but he still is hurt. So the field is super low on Joel Embiid, who does come off a monster game against Detroit, Steve, but I wonder if it's worth a risk knowing that he's playing through injury consistently and really isn't taking any time off. Yeah, you, you might have a better take on, take on it than me even for his injury, but I think his ownership being so low is probably the best argument I can make for him. All, all your concerns on him being banged up, I think are very legit. Um, 
and we will kind of see the same similar thing when we talk about Jokic as well. But uh, I think the fact that he is not popular at all and everyone has taken the same things into consideration and he is expensive. I'm not going overboard on him. Like I'm not, I probably won't even be like in 10% of my lineups, but I do think that he is a good leverage play. So him and Trey Young, may, maybe that's the way that you go on on this team on this game. I don't really love either, anyone else on on these these games, but uh, that might be the best option. I guess I guess actually I take that back on FanDuel. Tobias Harris and and on Yahoo as well. Tobias Harris looks pretty good for whatever reason, and I, and I don't even know why, but FanDuel seems to like hate Tobias Harris for like the <laughs> last year and a half. I always end up with so much Tobias Harris on. FanDuel and uh they're they just or else they like it to to pl- or else they like to price him down so that we can play him more there I, I don't know no, so, don't know. One, so one one way or the other I seem to always end up with Tobias Harris and I'm not sure he pays me off most of the time so maybe maybe they're just luring me into the trap I'm not sure but that was my follow-up is I don't know <laughs> if we have the ROI on, on by any means yeah so pro- probably worth uh tracking into but they're, they definitely seem to price him that way. They, but he does interest me again. He, I mean, he's getting good, solid minutes uh, as he normally does. And if this is one of the days that, you know, he, he comes and gets some three-pointers down and does some a little bit of extra rebounding at 7,400, when you compare it to his 8,400 price on DraftKings, I think that looks pretty appealing. Is 84 too much? And, and we're just waiting for this game. And I feel like, especially with Embiid hurt, the productivity – is not just poured on the shoulders of Tyrese Maxey or Seth Curry. It's there for Tobias Harris to be a 23 to 25 point per game scorer. And he's just not at that point. And maybe that's what you keep going back to are the nightmares of him just missing <laughs> that ceiling each and every night to truly pay out. But is that number just too much? It, it seems on the surface like it is just a little bit of a stretch, especially based on there being nine other games technically especially with atlanta even uh to pivot away from yep yeah i i feel like it is just a little bit too high especially th- that's the nice thing about playing over on yahoo and FanDuel. in addition to DraftKings, is you can get to a guy like tobias harris and get exposure to him at a price point that's a little bit more uh appealing so i think that's a good way to play it and, so, and sometimes like you even see his uh ownership being projected really low for DraftKings. you might hear like uh oh he's a good play and people will end up playing him on DraftKings, even though the the person talking about him being a good play is actually on one of the other sites. So it that's a that's a good way to take advantage of that, I think. Anybody else on the way out before we move on? Uh any punt option, low cost option you can get to. And you know, Furkan is so boom bust. Danny Green is out by all means, not physically, but just mentally, and got not a guy I trust on. You know, Tyrese Maxey, it, it's just the concern is that there's not enough distribution or anything outside of scoring. So if, it, if it's not there, 5,300 for Seth Curry may seem a little high as volatile as he can be. So you reference at the start, you don't love anybody else. Could you be talked into liking anybody else? <laughs> I think some of that boomer bust appeal from Corkmas is certainly reasonable and, and Seth Curry also, yeah. like, especially if we think that Embiid really isn't going to be able to be at a hundred percent and gets a, a few less minutes or, you know, takes a few plays off here and there. I think that there is certainly a little bit of, you know, merit that you could make for either of those. Uh, but, but their price makes it, I, I wish they would have priced them just a little bit lower so that we could have made a, a stronger push for them, but there's just, yeah, that price makes it pretty tricky. All right, let's move Utah mm-hmm. at Chicago and we'll start with the jazz where both of these teams right now, looking at the matchup itself, clearly one of the highlights on the board. When you're looking at the top from, and we can start with the Jazz, of course, you've got Mitchell there, the matchup as well, 8,200 on DK for Rudy Gobert, so not sure how much that appeals to you. Let's start at the top at the very least and see where you are compared to the field with your own exposure to Mitchell and Gobert. Yeah, so... I think with Conley out, it'll it'll be pretty interesting to see how they distribute the ball. L- luckily for Mitchell and Gobert, both of those, they're not, I mean, Conley's not a high 
uh, usage player anyways, most of the time, you know? So right. I, I think that it's not going to have a huge impact on them the way sometimes a, a key player like that would be out. So I think that in general, I'll pr- I think those guys are probably priced fair. I don't think that they're too high or too low. The Bulls have been pretty good also so far this year uh, as well. I, we'll see if they if they stay that way, but they, they've got a nice little core uh, going together. So I think on uh, Gobert, he's down at $33 on Yahoo, so that might be the place I like to play him the most. He's going to be more popular there than he is on, uh, on DraftKings, though. So... So I'm not, not super excited about him. The one that I might have a little bit more interest in, in is Clarkson uh, with Conley out. I do think that he's going to get some extra uh, run and I don't think that they've really priced him up enough. So Conley's price coming into the slate on DraftKings is 6,100 Clarkson is 5,400 on FanDuel 6,000 versus 5,300 and then on Yahoo 21 versus 19. Not that Clarkson is a one-for-one comparison to Conley because he's probably not going to get quite the same amount of minutes that Conley tends to get, but he does end up uh, playing a little bit more aggressive in his you know per minute usage. Like Clarkson is normally up around close to a, a point per minute, so with the extra minutes that we're expecting for him to get, probably somewhere around thirty, I think he makes a really good uh, guy to go to. Yeah, 5,400, again, on DK is, before we hit the Bulls, and just Rudy Gobert, just to go back, was it more of the cost, or was it just trust in him? And I'm looking on FanDuel, and just curious if at all he becomes a second or, or third type pivot. Super low owned to the field, kind of in the middle, actually, after refreshing this. 8,200, so you are saving a little bit on the higher owned guys, any interest in that regard? Yeah. I mean, I think I can get, we can get to him a little bit. So we have him in the, you know, around 10 ish to 10 to 15 range on fan duels, ownership projecting our optimal lineup percentage says that he should be about 9%. So he's slightly lower than what we're, what the field is owning him. I don't think that that's a bad range to be at, but that is one thing that uh, I am a little weary of. And that's a, a s- super cool thing that we have as a tool that a lot of places you know don't have that helps our users be able to determine if a player is a good play in a vacuum, if they're kind of getting there uh, often enough. And the same thing for like our boom percentage, we see him with about a 20% boom, which is, uh, it, does he get over his va- value for his price about 20% of the time. So uh, I think he's fine. Just, yeah, probably not someone that I'm going to be like super high on, but I'll, I'll get to him a bit. Mentioned O'Conley. I also saw it brought up in the chat as well. Any interest in getting to Ingles knowing, of course, that it might bump up at 4,700, at least on DK and a salary play, some productivity without having Conley on the floor. Yeah, I think he makes a lot of sense from that standpoint. Uh, that salary savings is going to be a pretty big as long as un- until we get some other type of news. So yeah, I think I I like going to uh, to Ingles for sure. There, he's going to get probably around. We're projecting him right around thirty minutes, and he's not quite as productive as uh, Clarkson, but uh, I think that he's going to be a fine play, and he could get a few extra shots uh, in this game as well. So yep, I think that's a good play. Like so- it. Uh, Steve, I'm curious, you know, looking at the Bulls and how we have with Vooch at the top, also Zach Levine and and knowing that price range at 8,800, 8,200 respectively on DK and, and looking, refreshing the ownership tool that we have available for you, of course, Awesome O Plus, Awesome O Plus, Plus Platinum. Each and every week, you can take full advantage of what we have going on here. I'm curious if this is going to be similar to what we kind of laid out with the Hawks and Sixers, where you see either of these guys as more a pivot away from what's happening, the rest on the slate? Yeah, I, I think so. I think uh, these aren't guys that I'm super excited about, but the, the, and our projections aren't going to probably ever be excited about but i think uh i think adam really says it kind of nicely with with these guys um 
so you have these you know four major players and they're all priced about the same price and they're never going to look great on a just normal basis uh, because their projection is kind of this, you know, a median outcome that they're going to expect, but they all are really good. And on some day, one of them's not going to play that well, and maybe even two of them not that well. And maybe it's Levine today, and he will be the beneficiary of uh, Vucevic and DeRozan not playing very well, or Levine just gets super hot and they give the ball to him consistently, and he's just scoring a lot. Or maybe it's Vucevic who. We don't necessarily know who that player is going to be, but I think that there is a really good chance that it's going to be one of them pretty much each slate. Uh, yeah. Certainly not every time, but I think that that makes them uh, interesting from the uh, strategy perspective. Mention Adam, his deeper dive. Adam shares NBA deeper dive free available to you each and every day of the week. You're going to find insane comprehensive looks all around from Adam on each and every day, each and every slate. So take full advantage of that. And you mentioned the run that both of you guys are having. He hits, passes the torch to you, you hit, and now you're back to continue that. Well, I need to hit a little bit more because he went a little bit more than me. So uh, I'm hoping so, though. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to open it up as a contest. I just meant as far as... Oh, oh, it is always a contest, it's I him, think. Right? Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. You're never going to get away from that by any means. All right. So outside of the top, when we start to look at any other options here, you know, both Ball DeRozan at that mid to high uh, 7K on DK, maybe there's the ability for some leverage with ownership. And then you start to look maybe a little bit lower as some lower cost slash punt options on the bulls. Yeah, I think those are the main guys that I'm going to be interested in is those main four. Um, it, it gets really tough after that. Caruso's price is low as is Troy Brown. They're getting some minutes, but uh, actually Caruso is getting quite a, quite a few minutes. So may, maybe he's okay, but it, it's just tough with, uh, with those main four to really have one of the other guys in the rotation that steps up and uh, has the outlier game, because let's just say, you know, Caruso starts getting really hot. He, he's got to not only if Vucevic was the only other player on the team, that was a big usage guy. He, okay you know, he can give it over to Caruso and let him take over for a while. But when you have four other guys that are uh, superstars, it's hard to really uh, stand out for these other guys. Yeah, and to your point, Vooch, the highest one at about 18%. Bulls do not look favorable by any means on the boom side of our boom bus tool tonight. And, and for that reason, uh, I'm sure specifically, so it's not just you laying it out, it's you laying it out with our metric behind it. By all means. All right, man, let's keep it moving here. Heat, Grizzlies, we're in Memphis now. And start on the road team, of course. Miami, clearly, and they come off a big one, scoring as well. Jimmy Butler is going to be there at the top, 8,600. Bam, of course, with the injury. So we factor everything in, even Kyle Lowry, who starts to dip a little bit from a price standpoint. Let's start with Butler, and I think more so from how much you're looking at him, but also compared to the rest of the slate from teams and position specifically in, at the three that we've talked already about, Steve, but also kind of hinting at who we have to talk about as well. Yeah, I, I think all three of the the big scorers here look pretty interesting. Their price is just low enough that's not that you can get to them uh, since we can't quite afford those other guys on the slate uh, as well. I don't think uh, at least the ones that we've talked about so far, Giannis, we haven't talked about, but uh, I think the ones that we've talked about so far, hasn't been uh, nearly as easy to get to. So, so I do like get into to these guys a little bit more. Bam is still questionable. I don't really see it as a huge risk. He ended up playing last night and he played 36 minutes and had 57 DraftKings points and kind of uh, won the slate for you if you were, uh, if you had him. So I don't think that he's a big risk here. I mean, I guess it's possible that they could have only played him 36 minutes with the anticipation that they were not going to play him today. I mean, that's a, a possibility. If that happens, then Butler and Lowry are going to be really good plays. Uh, I think they're already good plays as they are in this game against Memphis. So I, I especially on FanDuel for Lowry, uh, 5,900 there, when you compare his price to, to DraftKings at 7,100, I think that's a really nice play for him. And then Butler is always a good play. And I think he's a better play 
than normal uh, today. One, with this matchup against Memphis, and then two, with Bam potentially being limited. I think that that's a, a really good spot for him. If uh, Bam does end up sitting, I think that that will really kind of open things up for Deadman to be one of the slam dunk plays of the slate. I kind of hope that doesn't happen. That'll really change the slate around. And a lot of the guys that we've been talking about as value plays, you don't really need as much anymore uh, because Deadman at 3,200 on DraftKings is just way too cheap. 4,500 on FanDuel may not totally break the slate as much uh from a value standpoint but he's still going to be a really good price there and then he's the minimum on uh yahoo so so i think that that is really the key news that we're waiting for i think is that say 8 30 eastern start i believe yes eight o'clock eight o'clock eight eastern. o'clock yep. okay so yes. maybe 805 810 <laughs> yeah so maybe 8 30 still Could no. be. they might just be <laughs> waiting for bam at that point you don't know Real yeah. quick, though, let, let me follow up on Bam because I, I get why he makes sense, especially at that spot from a pivot standpoint. Even if you were looking at on FanDuel as well, the ownership is going to be lower. DK, we have him at 7.3%, and he's at 36 minutes, 30 minutes beforehand. Is there any concern? I guess the big concern and really lone concern I'd have here, Steve, is that, yes, he's not being sat for load management, But because it's a knee injury, because he played 36 minutes last night, because he expended so much energy in those 36 minutes last night, maybe this is a 22, 24 type minute night where you can cheat without sitting him on the bench. Yeah, I think that's a a really legitimate possibility. I I don't know that they'll go super low. I think if they want to really limit his minutes, they'll just sit him. Uh, It's early enough in the season that I don't see that as a, huge concern but it is definitely a possibility um and that just makes these other guys like butler and lauer even more attractive so i i think going to them yeah i mean it sounds like a, a pretty good idea you could potentially even get go to some dead men in that case right there is a chance that uh that he could always get some extra minutes in that situation right if if bam was somewhat limited they could give just some extra free minutes to dead men and while he's not a you know, 100% lock in that case, he does have the upside to, to really do well. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I would probably, if we don't know the news by lock, I, I would assume that Bam is playing and I would probably put him into my lineups, but I think I would still play a handful of dead men lineups just to have those out there anyways, just don't play them together. Right. One more before we flip sides and please, if you're hanging here, taking full advantage of Steve Buzzard's insights before we hit live before lock tonight coming up at the top of this hour. Hit that thumbs up button, right? We don't ask for much. In fact, we're giving you back $100 on your first deposit at Prize Picks on prizepicks.com. So we don't ask for much and we're giving back exponentially here. Smash away, hit that thumbs up button. And please, if you haven't subscribed already, as we're just getting underway this NBA season, you want to make sure you're subscribed. The notification bell reminds you when we're on each and every day so you don't pile in 45 minutes late. Hey, did, did they talk about Cunningham yet? Did they talk about? No, trust me. We have you covered from the jump here. Such a low-cost guy that everybody was getting to at the at really last year a lot, especially towards the end and into the playoff slates. P.J. Tucker at 3,300. New team. Not necessarily, I think, the best payout as we've seen so far, but is he a is he a guy you mentioned Deadman, but clearly that's due to circumstance at 3,200 on DK. Any interest at all compared to the field on Tucker? Uh, I mean, Tucker's not really one that has like a whole lot of upside just because of his, uh, you know, low points per minute. He just kind of hangs out there and shoots some threes. But um, yeah, I think you could, he's going to get a lot of minutes uh, either way. And I, I think that he could be another guy that benefits from a few extra minutes. If, uh, if Bam is out or if, you know, or if Bam uh, is limited in any sort of way. So it's, it's possible that you could go there. He's, he probably isn't a huge priority for me though. All right, let's look at the Grizz. John Morant, of course, up there at the top compared to the rest of the slate here as well, 9,400. So we're not even talking about, the highest price guy by any means on here. You have others, Steph at that spot and Trey Young even higher than him. 
forget pivot. Is this just based off of cost now one of the more appealing plays for you? Um, so I think the problem is just his, yeah, his cost is not as high as those other guys, but I, I still don't quite buy into him being that player yet. He certainly started off really hot this year. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if he keeps up that pace, uh, throughout the season. I'm not fully buying into him being as good as those, uh, you know, Steph and Giannis and, uh, even guys like Sabonis, maybe not even quite so much yet. So I'm going to do a little bit more weight on him. His ownership is very low. So it, it is always one thing that is nice in uh, DFS is to try to be ahead of the curve. And that's one way to get ahead of the curve is, is someone that's kind of trying to break out a bit and has, is not very popular at all. So you could, you could go that route and get a little bit of Morant into your uh, lineups, but uh, I probably wouldn't go overboard, maybe like five to 10% of my lineups or something like that. Probably not if you're, if you're building a single lineup. I'd also think that the the ownership and just where he is not all to do with the cost, but this is the heat. It's a really tough defensive matchup as well. So yes, the risk is a little higher, but that's going to, I'm sure, scare some people away on top of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. I I don't think he'll, he'll be uh, too popular at all. Uh, Even on FanDuel, he's even more expensive too, all the way up at 10,100. So that that's quite the price tag to, to pay over there. By all means. All right. So let's keep it moving here. No Brooks Jackson at 6,700 and, you know, start to look around. Melton actually looks like a, a good shot at somebody in that mid range based on how we've already been building with this slate so far. Is that a good place to start? Maybe Bain as well, both looking at that 54-53 on DK and not super high owned that it may be scaring people away. Yeah, I think Melton looks really good over on Yahoo in particular at uh, $20. That's a really good price for him. The rest of the sites, I think he's an okay play as well. Um, I They don't have anyone really out too much they've been kind of without brooks here for a little while so that's kind of baked into their price so they don't have anyone that's really mispriced i think all these guys are fair prices so you can get them into some of your lineups and they're not going to be too popular jaron jackson is a perfect example of that Uh, we have him in the low single digit ownership his boom percentage on our boom bus tool is at about 13%. So that's a pretty good leverage that you could potentially take on him. He's been having some scores in the mid thirties and you know, you always expect those big games to come every now and then like it did a couple of days ago where he had a 40 point DK game. So I think that he would probably be my favorite option of those. I guess if Kyle Anderson, I, I forgot about him. If he's questionable, um, I think you could play him if he plays. He, he should be a pretty decent spot. His price is pretty low. And then if he is out, you could see some extra minutes uh, going to all those guys that we we're just talking about, like Bain or Melton or uh, maybe even Brandon Clark potentially could get a little bit of a bump as well. So I think that there's uh, some okay options in that case. All right. Bucks hosting the Spurs and Giannis right there at the top. We'll get to him in a second. Let's clear out San Antonio first and see if you've identified any good value here from the Spurs standpoint. Um, yeah, so the Spurs, I've been playing a lot, it feels like, so far this year. This is not yeah, an ideal matchup. Already? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting, right? It, I felt like without DeRozan, they were really going to to step up and have a lot of good value. And they've been okay. And I think that they kind of feel like that again today. They kind of feel like they're okay plays. Their price is reasonable. Uh, you've got DeJounte Murray at the top. His 8,500 price is pretty okay on DraftKings. It looks even better on FanDuel, even though it's 8,600, you just have a little bit more uh, savings that you can get to there and and afford that a little bit better. Uh, And he also looks really good at $33 on on Yahoo as well. So he's probably one of the better, I would say pay up options. I guess that's not like a full pay up, but it's a, it's enough of a pay up that, you know, he he should be there. Uh, Derek White also is, I think, fairly appealing. He's, I don't think he's done quite as well as what I would have hoped. He's 
just around a point a minute, a little bit over, uh, which has been fine. I was kind of hoping he would take a little bit more of a step up, but he just has a lot of other, you know, they have a lot of okay players, just not great players on this team with um, Keldon Johnson and Lonnie Walker, Pirtle. Um, I mean, that's a okay team, right? You have, the, so I think I've said okay several times here now with, uh, with the Spurs. They just, it just feels like they're, they're not someone that is going to, make your lineup but if you get the right guy and at the right price it might be a one that kind of keeps you in the running to be able to win something the game manager if you will yeah uh, that's a NBA good state, right? that's what we'll, that's what we'll call them the spurs yeah. is the game manager of this slate they're not going to kill you by any means but they're not going to win you the game we get that by all means all right so let's flip it and injury galore here clearly with the bucks let's get the obvious out of the way Yes, Giannis right there at the top from a cost standpoint, but even when things don't go their way, losing to the Wolves at home, he's still a monster. I mean, it's Giannis, so I don't know if you're maybe not 100% clearly tonight, Steve, but how much at all compared to the field as well, where he's not even the super high owned compared to some lower end guys that are just from a cost to leverage standpoint, but seems like you can get to a lot of Giannis tonight. Yep, I think so. Uh, he he's definitely my favorite play of the high cost players. His price is not cheap at eleven thousand four hundred, eleven thousand three hundred, and then fifty six all the way up at, on Yahoo. But I think even at those price points, it's pretty appealing. He's he's getting you know around one point six, one point seven points uh, per minute. He's playing more minutes this year fairly consistently. Like. He's in the you know low 30s fairly consistently, so I th I think that you definitely want to play him. I mean, to your point, everyone is out. They've got Portis missing. They've got DiVincenzo out. Drew Holiday, Brooke Lopez. So I think they're going to lean on uh, Giannis pretty heavily. They'll probably also lean on Middleton a fair amount, although yes. his prices kind of come up a little bit. Um, too much? 7,800. I'm surprised that it's not a little higher based off of the injuries. We only have him on DK at about 12, 12 and a half percent ownership in between there, depending on as we get closer to lock. But where is the productivity coming from outside of Giannis? Yeah, I think Middleton is definitely going to have to be that guy, right? So... Um, the other thing that they, so, so Middleton is the other guy that you, you know, for sure of the, after that, it gets a little bit tricky. So I think you could slide down and get some good value, uh, because we don't really know where that productivity to your, your point yes. is coming from, right? We, we've got Grayson Allen, I think is super cheap over on Yahoo at 11. Uh, he's, and they also have, Nora at 11 as well, Pat Connaughton at 12, uh, George Hill at 10. And then he's, all those guys are priced up a little bit higher from the minimum than what they are at, at Yahoo. But over at Yahoo, all those guys, I think you could easily see getting a, a fair amount of minutes and a fair amount of uh, uh, extra uh, usage. So I think those all make a lot of sense. And then they're not nearly as good of plays on DraftKings and FanDuel, but they are giving you enough unpredictability in their playing time uh, that I think you could go there. Probably Connaughton is my favorite one okay. for his price uh, of those guys. But uh, but yeah, I think it's it's interesting to be, mix and match them a little bit and uh, just hopefully one of them hits. It's it's kind of that idea of like we were talking about for um, for the Bulls that we don't know 100% which one of them it's going to be. They all look kind of okay, but it's a pretty good chance that at least one of them, maybe not in the winning lineup, but will definitely be in one of the top lineups. All right, so we're going to have a similar conversation, I'm sure, about Steph with the Warriors, but let's start with the road team. Thunder in Golden State right now, and if it's SGA at the top at 7,300, you're not, you're going to get value on the board, especially for someone like Giddy at 5K in the return, at least. Are you getting to many Thunder tonight on your lineups? 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, Shay is always a great play. Uh, I, <laughs> I listen to all these shows and uh, listen to the chat and see what you guys are saying most days. And I know a lot of people are always down on SGA, it seems, because maybe he has a few bad games here or there. But his price is always pretty reasonable, and it is again today. Yeah. Uh, so 7300 7200 even on FanDuel, uh, where, where you have more money to spend, and, and 33 on uh yahoo i think all of those are really nice prices he is let me see he's been you know he's had a really nice let's see he's had yeah the last couple of games he so it was the the first few he started off really poorly with you know sub 30 point games but he's had 47 DraftKings points 40 and 52 uh his last three games and getting in the mid 30 or uh, almost in the even upper 30s in minutes the last few games so that's just like too low of a price for me uh for SGA and I think that he makes pretty good he does he is catching a little bit of ownership so that is a little bit of a, a concern although in Yahoo it looks like he's not getting a whole lot so that's a, a little bit surprising but, uh, but yeah, I think SGA is good. You could certainly go to Giddy as well. Uh, like you were mentioning, I think yeah. that that's a, a fine play also. Yeah, I, that would be the, the only one there kind of looking at it. So let's flip to the Warriors. Steph, kind of a similar conversation, different position clearly, but kind of a similar conversation that we just had with Giannis, right, as far as where you're looking at him, the cost, and even if it's worth a pivot elsewhere. Yeah, so Steph is tricky. So he is really priced up. He's almost as much as Giannis, and Giannis is just, you know, quite a bit better. Maybe not in real life. I, <laughs> I think he is better in real life at this point, but he's at least closer in real life. From a DFS standpoint, Giannis is just uh, so much better, yeah. uh, unfortunately. So we we talked earlier about some of the guys like Trey Young who had you know, super low ownership at this higher cost. And you can make a good argument for, okay, you, you could go to Trey Young and he can have a blow up game, but even Curry is getting some ownership with him. So he's in the, the low double digit area. And so you're not really getting that much difference and you're paying more for a guy that isn't quite as good. So I, I think he's more of a fade for me. Okay. As a whole, and again, the ownership is just so low. So I guess it's just not workable because of the cost. This is one where the cost trumps the ownership. Yeah, and, and the ownership isn't as low, right? So so it's like, a to me, the way I think about some of the ownerships on the low end, if you get really low, like Trey Young, you're going to have like one, t You if you have 10,000 people in the contest, you're going to have a hundred people with Trey right. young, whereas you'll have a thousand still with, with Curry at like 10 X, the ownership. So there's still a lot of, uh, you know, Curry lineups out there that you'll have to beat. It just, it's, it's a pretty big group. So that that's probably where I'm at. Um, let's it. see out outside Given of that green, right? Yeah. Um, I think especially we'll have to see what happens with uh, Damian Lee. He's questionable as is, Juan Toscano Anderson. So Toscano Anderson doesn't seem like a big deal in, in general, but if Lee and Anderson are both out, that's another 30 minutes that we got to spread around to guys like uh, Jordan Poole, uh, Otto Porter. So I think that those are, and Wiggins also. So yeah, you mentioned Wiggins. All of those guys. You know, both of those don't seem like big news in the, of themselves, but if both of them happen to be out, I think those other guys could get kind of interesting and they might be uh, good late swap people. I see Eric in the, in the chat and I know he wants to talk late swap. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go for it. <laughs> we'll, we'll say that this is the, the place that he might be able to take advantage of that. Yeah. And, and you mentioned pool, the price keeps going up. The productivity keeps dropping. So I wonder if that wave is on its way down at this point. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I Not don't to know. say to fade him by any yeah. means or stay yep. the hell away from him. He's still at 6,200 on that's DK, a... Steve. But I, I mean, I'm just saying it's subtle. That's all. Maybe yep. I should have added that word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it actually is pretty interesting to, to look at the different prices on him. I hadn't even noticed too closely, but 6,200 on DraftKings, 55 on FanDuel, and 17 on uh, Yahoo. So if you're going to go with pool, 
you should uh, definitely go over to the Yahoo streets to do so. Um, not so much in the DraftKings streets. All right. Anybody else maybe on the super lower end here? You mentioned Damian Lee kind of figuring out what what's going on there, but doesn't seem like there's any smaller, lower cost punt options that you have really on either team. Uh, no, I, th- I think that'll pretty much be the guys unless unless those two Golden State guys are out. All right, so let's flip it here. Wolves hosting the Nuggets. Mentioned that Wolves' big victory against the Bucks, And again, final 10 for us, but live before lock with Greg and Terry coming your way in 10 minutes so you don't have to go anywhere. They have you covered right up until the slate locks. Hit that thumbs up button, please. You're in here. You're hanging. We're giving you everything, including a free match of your first deposit up to $100 at prizepicks.com. So hit that thumbs up button, the notification bell, so you know when we start. And, of course, subscribe here to what we're doing on Awesome, all three channels here, the Awesome DFS Fantasy Football and Odds channel. So let's look Jokic at the top. And we've been talking about guys where, you know, the knee injury, not an issue. He's going to play tonight. But we've been talking about guys on the top of the slate as far as high cost. So where is Jokic in comparison to the others, especially now that we have still lingering with the cat discussion, but also having Embiid as the other center we brought up? So, so first of all, I want to mention, if we see in chat someone asking who plays on Yahoo, the answer should be, pretty much anyone if you want to win money because right. the Jeez. that's where you have the lowest uh cost contest the softest players and if you're trying to especially if you're trying to start out uh there's no reason to really play at some of the bigger sites when you have the option to play at yahoo first so that's why i love throwing in the prices over there um so if you don't want to play there, that's fine. Everyone has their own opinions. But if, if I'm giving you some best, the best advice I can give yeah. you is to play at Yahoo. Look, I think you have a track record and resume that would say, hey, if you're suggesting somebody goes plays a DFS tournament on a specific site, that we should at least give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyways, back, back to the Denver. Yes. Uh, Jokic, I think, is really interesting. So the last two games, like last game he played 25 minutes yesterday, it was a blowout. Uh, he still got to 46 points, I think. And then he, in 15 minutes, the game before when he got injured, he had 41 points. So he's just putting up massive numbers. Uh, I think that he can do that again today. His price is up there with everybody, and it's not going to be easy to get to him. But uh, I think that we would definitely take a shot uh, on him. And then outside of that, I think that you can kind of mix and match the rest of these guys. Uh, I don't think that anyone stands out as like a, a great play to me. Uh, How about Aaron but, Gordon at 5,100 on DK? We have a yeah, pretty high on, on the boom tool. That's, that's why I asked. Yeah, I, th- I think that that's probably probably the best one of those options. Okay, awesome. Yep. So let's flip it. Cat is up there now, ninety nine hundred from a cost standpoint. He's the best pivot of the three, but you also have to deal, as you mentioned, with Jokic. I would imagine that if you were looking at Carl Anthony Towns just from a play overall standpoint, you're probably going to get to a lot of him tonight. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, but Jokic is a tough matchup. And I think that, uh, I think it's really just tough to get that price point uh, today. Oh, again, that'll, that'll change. No, I think, I mean, I think high, sorry. Pri- yeah, no, I think his price is fine. It's just the, there's not a lot of savings in a lot of places. So uh, unless we get some guys like Deadman out there, I, I think it's just hard to pay up to, for too many other guys, especially if I want guys like Giannis um and you know some of the other guys we talked about earlier so i think towns is fine he's probably you know you could you could be in the five to ten percent range but his he is getting about 11 percent ownership so i think that that's like makes him an okay play but maybe a slight fade for me anthony edwards 7800 anybody even below d'angelo russell at 68 there's an opportunity at least i don't know if the cost is too high as far as the payout 
Yeah, he'd probably be my my favorite option on this team. Actually, will be Russell, uh, j- just because that price point is pretty good on DraftKings at sixty eight hundred. He's been, you know, he's always a guy that I can count on uh, for solid minutes, and his his production is pretty good too. So yeah, I think he's good. All right. Reminder, of course, coming up at the top of the hour, live before lock, you've got Greg and Terry coming your way, answering every and every question as far as injuries are concerned, rolling in. We have one more game to hit on, and it's the Cavs at Phoenix. Let's start with Cleveland if it's at the high price point, which, of course, is not going to be super high with Cleveland from Mobley and Colin Sexton. And then we can end with Devin Booker and company. Sure. This this one's not a super appealing from a Cleveland standpoint. Phoenix is uh, pretty darn tough, and it's a and they just came off. Yeah, even the Lakers could beat Cleveland. So I mean, what else can you say? They're they're not in good shape. Um, nice. I, I think uh, you know if Okoro doesn't or doesn't play, which, which is what we're expecting um, right now, I think that that is does open up a little bit of playing time for some guys but yeah i i don't think i'm going to get super excited about this game or this this side let's side so let's, it, right. yeah on, on the phoenix side because of how weak uh cleveland is i think that this is a fine play uh no one stands out as like a must play there but they're all priced i think just a little bit too low uh for this type of matchup cleveland coming off of the back to back and you could really go to Booker, Paul, Aiton, Bridges. Any of these guys, I think, are making a lot of sense. Even if you wanted to get uh, JaVale McG- McGee at 3,300 right now, he's even okay. He s- shows up in 10% of our optimal lineups, which is a little bit surprising, but that's a nice way to, one, see how tough the slate is from a price perspective, and then, two, just – you know, like he has some upside, he has some extra volatility. And so don't forget about him necessarily. I think he could actually uh, be kind of interesting as well. Awesome. My friend, a pleasure. I know we jammed through everything here, the 10 games, we got everybody covered from the best and, and really more difficult plays. So at Steve buzzer, you want to thank him as we continue this hot streak on the deeper dive, do it on Twitter at Shander show for me. Thanks to Mike Awesome Yo for producing the Deeper Dive. Again, don't go anywhere as we have you covered for the next hour up until this slate locks at 7 o'clock Eastern with Greg and Terry. So we appreciate you, at least for this first portion of the Deeper Dive. Hit that thumbs up button on your way. Don't go anywhere on our way out. And make sure you're subscribed here as well. A pleasure, brother. Thank you, Steve, for everything. All right, we'll see you guys.
Cool. It is the Osmo NBA Live Before Lock Show, and uh, you, you might have recognized me from the deeper dive. I was just on there unsuspecting. I'm ruining just multiple shows here today. So, but like Mike Awesome, yo, who's doing a great job producing for us, but this is the first oh. time that he has done the back to back NBA Deeper Dot NBA Live Before Lock. And there's usually a waiting room set up in Zoom, and just Mike didn't know that there was that we usually do a waiting room. So I have the link to Mike Zoom. So I click on anything. I'm doing my job. We're supposed to show up 15 minutes before to check our audio, check our camera and all that. All of a sudden I go into Zoom. I'm on the show. And I'm like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. So then Jordan Klein texts me. He goes, you're on the deeper dog. You're ruining the show. So I go, that's no good. I have to, I have to exit Zoom now. And then he texts me back. He goes, no, you made it way worse. So I was like, oh, well, that's, that's even worse news. So, so now I'm here. I'm feeling bad because uh, Mike's doing his first back-to-back -back show. And apparently I've ruined the entire experience for him. But Anyway, I'm happy to doing the show. It is sponsored by Prize Picks. I'm here joined by Terry McBride. Terry, more importantly than any of my faux pas here, we have a 10-game NBA slate to talk about, and how are you feeling about it? I'm feeling good about it. I've been running some crunches. I wrote uh, my article this afternoon. We've gotten a little bit of news, but we had a few of the key pieces, I think, as far as like injuries, ins, outs, uh, fairly early in the day. So we kind of know a lot about the slate, I think, going in, unless something goes completely haywire, which, you know, it's live before lock, that kind of thing does tend to happen. But I like the shape of the slate right now. So I'm excited to get into it and, uh, and talk about it with you. Yeah. And let's talk about some of the injury news, too, because we've had a bunch of it come out and, uh, and still a lot that's yet to come. I think most recently, though, what's pressing, and this is going to be something that really impacts DraftKings, Cade Cunningham. The first overall pick in the draft, he is expected to play today. However, he's going to be on a minutes restriction, so that's important news. We've currently got Bam Adebayo questionable. That is something we need to wait on. Kyle Anderson also questionable. That could open up some extra value on the wings in Memphis. And then we've got Damian Lee questionable over in Golden State. But since we talk about guards first, I want to open up by asking you about Cade Cunningham because he's extremely cheap on DraftKings at 3600 Top overall pick in the draft. Looks like he's going to play somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 minutes. Does that make him a viable play for you when he's such a well-regarded prospect, limited minutes, but also a cheap price tag? I'm a little concerned. I mean, I, you got to love the price tag, right? That's what it's all about on the DK slate. So you do have that factor, which I understand where some of his ownership is coming from. But just looking at some of Alex's numbers, even at 3,600, we're getting him, we've got him with a 20.8 projection, just raw median projection on DraftKings. That's with a 26 minute projection. They're saying he's going to be between 20 and 25. So 26 is on the high end already. And that's giving him a 19% boom score probability in our model, but he's only coming up in the optimal like 8% of the time with eligibility at both guard spots on DK. And he's getting owned way, way more than that. So as a foundational value piece, I question it just because of the minutes. If he comes in on the low side of those minutes with that low and optimal rate when he's on the high side, I just get really worried about his actual value. I know he looks like a standout value play and we believe in the talent. And if he's at this price, maybe, you know, come the beginning of next week, middle of next week, then I think it's maybe a better spot when we're a little bit more secure in the minutes. He's got a little bit of NBA time under his belt. Right now, I'm really concerned with the negative 26 leverage score. And sometimes with value plays like this, you don't get too worried about the leverage. You just kind of plug and play. I don't know that he's that play tonight. I, I question it a little bit despite the price tag. Yeah, and so uh, something else to add here is in terms of projecting points per minute rates, I think he is going to be somebody who averages over a fantasy point per minute this year. However, also, we didn't see him play in the preseason. He sat out all the preseason with that ankle injury, at least in summer league, which still isn't very telling because he's playing against lesser competition. We saw Cade Cunningham play 27.7 minutes per game. He averaged 35.42 DraftKings points. I still do really like him as a value play. I guess the question really becomes, like you said, go underweight to the field on him. But now let's talk about cash games with Cade Cunningham. Do you still want to play him in cash games and with the uncertainty when we're just considering the ownership and the price tag? So I guess it would be what comes together in my cash lineup for DK and where I can use him. Like you've got other guys in the $4,000 range in terms of uh, being able to put guys at that point at the, uh, at the guard spots on DK. So I don't know that we need him, but he certainly is going to buy you a lot. He's the cheapest guy with that kind of upside on the board. Just looking at our, uh, at our optimal rate or actually, no, excuse me. Kira Lewis is making a liar out of me at 3000. So Kira Lewis, a little bit more optimal, a lot less ownership on him. 3000 gets you there a little bit more frequently than Cade Cunningham does. 
Um, you've got, you know, similar minutes, kind of a, uh, kind of a, a, a number on uh, Kira Lewis. He's around a 20 minute projection on him, lower overall aggregate projection on him uh, in the median projection on DK, but he is cheaper. He is coming up a little bit more optimal and you get him positive leverage only around 3% ownership compared to the 35% you're getting on Cade Cunningham. So just with other options, and it's more for me, I'm more inclined to look into, uh, you know, some of the higher price guys that are in like that $4,000 range. But if we run it through the optimal and we take a look and he is coming through in the optimal, then it makes some sense and you got to consider him for cash games. And I think there's also just, you can follow the chalk and follow the follow it. At worst, you're getting the block out of it with, uh, with Cunningham's ownership where it is for cash. So I think it does make sense overall. And by the way, much different on FanDuel than DraftKings because on FanDuel, he is priced a little more appropriately at 5000 I will say this. I'm a little higher on Cade Cunningham personally than our projections are. Like I said, I have him as a greater than points minute fantasy producer, which it looks like we don't have over on Osmo.com. So we have Cade Cunningham project for around 20 fantasy points. I have him for about 26 because I have him as a guy who scores more than a fantasy point per minute. I have him projected for 24 minutes. It puts him right around 26. So uh, I like him a little bit higher. I don't have an issue getting to him in tournaments. I do think the ownership is a little bit steep. Cash games, he's a no-brainer to me. I would certainly be looking to play Kate Cunningham in cash games. Uh, I also want to ask you about the Bam Adebayo injury, because I think that's something else that's going to be really pivotal for this slate. We have the Miami Heat and Memphis Grizzlies. They play at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Bam currently listed as questionable. Now, with that said, he was listed as questionable to play yesterday. Ultimately, ends up getting whirled in. No issues. Uh, probably not something we'll know before lock, but we might, uh, at the very least, hopefully, uh, Terry and I are going to be sticking around for 30 minutes after the slate locks, Terry and I are doing the show from six to seven Eastern time. Then from seven to seven 30, we're going to be talking about prize picks and props over there, but also any news that breaks that's relevant to FanDuel or DraftKings, Terry and I are still going to be breaking down the implications of it. So Bam Adebayo, a player who could get ruled out or ruled in, in those 30 minute time slot where we could uh, talk about some of the implications, but as of right now, Bam Adebayo listed this question. Well, do you have any kind of lean whether he plays or does not play? I sure hope he plays because I've got a ton <laughs> of them in my current set of lineups. Uh, he was coming up quite a bit for me on the FanDuel slate. Um, so I, I think he's going to play. My read on it is that he is. But second night of a back-to-back -back with a lingering injury, there's always that question. He went, like you said, he went last night and he played 35-some-odd minutes, had a monster game. He was a difference maker on the slate last night. And I absolutely think we could see that again here. It's just a question of, you know, do they give him that rest? Does he, or maybe do they pull back minutes even? Like, does he go and he just doesn't get that full, like 35-ish minute run? But even at 32 minutes, Alex has him projected for, he's one of the top plays on both sites in terms of the optimal lineup rate, in terms of the boom score probability, the raw median projection on both sites. So I'm happy to get to him. I think he's probably still underpriced, 7,900 on the FanDuel slate, 77 on the DK slate. For his talent, for his general upside, uh, that said, I'm getting to the heat uh, quite a bit, just the three stars in general with Jimmy, uh, Kyle Lowry, and, uh, and Bam. So I was getting a lot of mix and match of those guys. So if one sits, I'm happy to take the other two. And in this case, it would be if Bam sits, I'm happy to uh, give a little boost to Kyle Lowry, although I don't think I could get much more of him. I have a ton of them. And then definitely to Jimmy Butler, who I liked earlier in the day, and I think would only increase from that. All right. And we did get a question in our premium Discord channel, which I've gotten to work. I've got my notifications working there and found a way. I was in a goofy situation where with Discord, either I was getting all of the notification from like every channel or none of them, but I figured out a way that I'm getting them accurately just from our, uh, just from our basketball channel for doing basketball shows. But Mr. Moneybags is asking us, is TJ McConnell still a good value play with Levert returning? This is a DraftKings related question. So I actually think that on a points per dollar basis, TJ McConnell is the best overall play on DraftKings. He's priced at just 4,900, which it's odd to see that his price tag went down considering that we had TJ, that we had TJ McConnell start last night. We had Karis LeVert out and we had uh, Malcolm Brogdon out. And then we've got a situation today where New Brogdon was out ahead of time. TJ McConnell still sees a discount, discounted price goes from 5,500 to 4,900. I still think McConnell starts. I still think he plays uh, fairly significant minutes. I don't think we're going to see Karis LeVert right out of the gate come play 30, 32 minutes. He has a long injury history. He hasn't played yet this year. So I still really like TJ McConnell at 4,900. But what do you think of McConnell? 
Yeah, I like the spot. It's you know maybe it took a slight ding when uh, when we got Levert announced as as playing at least. Maybe he scoops up a couple of the minutes that I was hoping that McConnell would get. But I still think he gets around the twenty eight that Alex hasn't projected for. I was trying to nudge him up a little bit when we didn't have Levert on the board. But I do think it's an excellent play, uh, and he's been down a little bit so far this season. So it might be a guy who people are a little bit remiss to play. If you look at some of his numbers, just a four forty eight true shooting percentage for the beginning of the season explains a lot about his dip to a uh, 0.80 fantasy point per minute rate. He was a 1.06 with 14.9% usage last year. This year, getting 15.8% usage in 23.8 minutes. And the, and the uh, overall production has gone down. So with an increase in minutes, with an increase in ex- uh, expectation of usage with Levert and, uh, and uh, Brogdon both off the floor last season, he was uh, around 1.15 fantasy points per minute, seeing around 18% usage. So figure Levert maybe cuts into that a little bit, but we're still talking about well over a fantasy point per minute player when he's going right. If we get him making some more of his shots tonight, I think it's a, it's a home run play. So I still do like him uh, quite a bit more so on the DK slate at 4,900 but I think the positional flexibility point guard and shooting guard on FanDuel buys you back a little bit of the price difference. So I like them on both sides. Yeah. And then talking about some of the high end guards over on, and I guess we could start by talking about DraftKings, and then we could bring it over to FanDuel. Although this kind of goes for both sides. I'm finding myself playing a lot of cheaper players at the guard position, both point guard and shooting guard, and then paying up more for the forwards, which I mean, makes sense when you consider that we have, uh, we, we have Giannis and Ted Kumpo to pay up for on this league. We have guys like Julius Randle, DeMontis Bonus. So I tend to go a little bit cheaper at guard where I think there's better value. And a lot of my lineups end up being, you know, stars and scrubs with paying up for, for forward, saving at guards. What are you doing with the high end of the guards? Because we've got guys like John ja Morant, Trey Young, Steph Curry, Donovan Mitchell. Not much ownership there, uh, but do you think they're good players to get to today? Yeah, I mean, those guys are always in a vacuum, good players to get to, right? They're, they're guys who have monumental upside. They're guys who could smash through and put up the, the highest score on any given slate. But just when we take into account what we care about with DFS, the amount that these guys are coming up optimal, where the salaries land, where the positioning lands, for me, yeah, it's very much the same situation. I'm just getting so many point guard, shooting guard combinations with a lot of these value guys, a lot of these mid-range guys who I think – they need to do some, well, I don't know that they need to do some work on it because I like the way that it's been coming together with uh, a lot of cheap guards and then getting a lot of the higher price plays in through the forward positions. And then maybe like a lot of, uh, of mid-range centers that I've been getting to, particularly with the center and power forward flexibility on FanDuel. I think there's a lot that you can mix and match this year in terms of where you're getting these guards. So yeah, for me, it's been a lot of the value guards, including you know getting to uh, some Jordan Clarkson, definitely getting some uh, of the Orlando guards with Jalen Suggs leading the way on that. I think Shea Gilgis, Gilgis Alexander is underpriced by probably a thousand if he starts you know, performing like he's supposed to. So there's a lot of guys on the board that I like getting to in that mid range for me, especially with putting a lot of lineups through the optimizer, I'm finding that I have to force some of the higher price guards if I want to get to them or just manipulate it in my sorting process. So it's a little bit difficult. And sometimes I worry a little bit about leaving those guys on the table, but it's just coming up so frequently optimal the other way around that. Uh, yeah, that's how I'm seeing it as well. Okay, I think that definitely makes sense. But I'll ask you, if you had to roster one of these high price guards on DraftKings or FanDuel, I do think that they're kind of similar in terms of the point guards across both sites. So in between uh, Steph Curry, Trey Young, and John Moran, if you're only rostering one of them, who would it be today? So there is a little bit of a wrinkle in that uh, you can get Jimmy Butler shooting guard on the FanDuel slate. And I do like Jimmy quite a lot there, uh, getting him very, very optimal on the FanDuel slate where he's 9,500. Uh, on DK, he's only a, sh- a small forward and only 8,600. Love the play over there, but he doesn't qualify for your question. Uh, I think out of the pure guards, I think it would probably be Steph for me. Just I, it's always, it's very frequently, I should say, going to be Steph. And he's coming up in, in terms of Alex's numbers as the more optimal play when we compare to Ja, when we look at some of these other guys. Um, so it would probably be Steph. If you want to take a, a step down in salary, I do like the looks of Deonta Murray on this slate, getting him very frequently optimal on the FanDuel slate, a little bit less so on the DK slate. He's another guy, point guard and shooting guard on FanDuel, only point guard on DK. So that cuts into his overall optimal rates, but he's very positively leveraged across both sides. So I like getting to him there. Um, but out of the ultra high price guards, I think it would just be Steph just on the, call it a little bit of infatuation with Steph's game. I just love the upside that he can bring to the table in terms of that shots falling. There's, there's nobody that I like getting to better. All right. We do have a super chat here from uh, Aiden Queskin. I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your 
uh, last name there, but we did have a super chat. Sorry if I missed at the top of the show. It kind of got buried by some messages, but thank you for the follow-up because now I've circled back and found it. But he says, how do you like, how do you feel about getting Ingles and Clarkson in the same lineup plus correlation? No, that is absolutely negative correlation. So in terms of the reason that it's negative correlation is Ingles and Clarkson, they were two of the top candidates for six man of the year last year. The reason being that they were two of the top six man of the year candidates last year is because, well, they both came off the bench for the Jazz, but also they were competing with each other for minutes. So I look at them as negatively correlated, not positively correlated. And that's not to say that individually, I don't think that they're both good plays, but in terms of getting them into the same lineup, I do think there is negative correlation there. Something else also is even though Mike Conley is out today, uh, I don't know that there's that many minutes that are available to go because there's still guys like me, uh, me, Oni and Jared Butler who are in Utah's rotation this year who weren't really as involved last year. So individually, I think Clarkson and Ingles are both viable plays, but playing them together is something I prefer not to do in tournaments. Uh, but Terry, how do you feel about Joe Ingles and Jordan Clarkson first individually, but then also together in the same lineup? Yeah, I agree with your, your take there. I don't think I would want them together, but I do like them both individually, uh, given the uh, the Conley absence. And we're getting that in the uh, in the site's numbers. You're getting Clarkson as the more frequently optimal play between the two. Uh, and Ingles is getting a little bit over-owned across both slates. So that's definitely something to consider. You're paying a lot less for Ingles, of course, 4,700 on both sites as compared to 53 and 54 for Clarkson. Similar flexibility across positions. I do like the upside that Ingles gains, but I think I would lean more toward Clarkson if I was deciding between the two. And it's mostly based on leverage. They're getting similar overall aggregate ownership numbers, but Clarkson's coming up a lot more frequently optimal, basically double the optimal lineup rate on FanDuel, like two thirds again uh, on top of uh, on the DK slate. So I just like getting to the more frequently optimal guy and I'll, I'll eat a little tiny uptick of ownership there especially when you're getting that much leverage back on it. So I, I prefer the Clarkson play. I wouldn't want them together, but I do like both individually. Yeah. And for cash games, I don't have an issue playing both. And if you're talking about a cash game situation for tournaments though, uh, it's a little suboptimal to have both. If this was a four or five game slate, then I say, you know, beggars can't yeah. be choosers. You just play both of them, but 10 games slate for tournaments, I would prefer to not have both of them. Uh, also, as for Jordan Clarkson, I view him as a higher upside player than Joe Ingles. I think Joe Ingles is the better real-life player because he's the much better shooter. He's far more efficient than Jordan Clarkson. But for fantasy purposes, Jordan Clarkson's inefficient ways sometimes play out positively for DFS because he's not afraid to take shots, often posts a really high usage rate. Uh, so far this year, he has a 29.9% usage rate. Last year, 29.8%. So not anything that's way out of bounds there. So Jordan Clarkson's going to shoot a lot more than Joe Ingles when both on the court. So for fantasy purposes... I prefer, uh, I prefer Jordan Clarkson. Uh, but let's walk through the guard position and some of the other players to get to in the, uh, the mid-range here. And I know you said you like Jimmy Butler a lot, although more on the high end and also a uh, uh, fan to play over at shooting guard. But I want to ask you what your opinion is on Andrew Wiggins, who at 6,400, if you look at his box score, now this is not necessarily something to make decisions off of, but uh, he's alternated good games and bad games for DFS. So here are his DraftKings point totals, 24, 33, 23, 39, 26. It is a Christmas tree in terms of green being good games, red being bad games over on Fantasy Cruncher uh, when you look at the game log. But we've seen Andrew Wiggins be a guy that has pretty substantial upside when he's priced in this mid-6K range. Uh, he also has small forward eligibility on DraftKings. The minutes have been there. He played 37 minutes last game. We've seen him with a usage rate as high as 31%. So I really like getting to Andrew Wiggins in the high end. Uh, is he somebody you like for this slate? Um, for me, he's over-owned, and I just I don't love getting to Wiggins in general. I see the value in terms of he's priced down at 6,300, 6,400 across the two sites, multi-position at shooting guard and small forward across the two sites. I love when guys are guard and forward on the DK slate because you can move them around to those five different spots, and it just opens up so much flexibility. So I think if I was going to play him, it would probably be on the DK slate where you're scraping by with a little bit more uh, flexibility there, but he's, he, and he's less over-owned on the DK slate. He's really negatively leveraged on FanDuel at a negative 12.9 in our leverage score. And he's only coming up less than 8% optimal, 7.6% of the time in the optimal lineup. It's a less optimal play, 5.7% on the DK slate, but just with a little bit more leverage, uh, it's still a negative four play over there, but a little bit more leverage, a little bit more flexibility. 
I think I would prefer it there, but for me, it's just not a guy that I love going to. Uh, looking at his year, his numbers for this season, 9.3% assist uh, percentage, 7.6% uh, rebounding share, just doesn't do a lot other than score buckets from time to time, 0.93 fantasy points per minute, 22.5% usage in 31.2 minutes. I, I He's a guy who seems like he should be better than this and just doesn't give me a lot on the floor. So I don't love getting to Wiggins in most situations. Um, and he's not coming up a ton for me. So it would be it would be a no for me, but I can see a little bit more utility in him on the DK slate, I think. All right, we do have another question in our premium Discord channel. This one was from, uh, let's see, where did it go? This is from uh, Swanson79. He's asking, would you go over the fields on McGee and Banton? I assume that that's supposed to read Barton. So would you go over the field on JaVale McGee and Barton, fade Cade Cunningham on DK? So Cunningham's going to be really popular, but I think it's justified that he's that popular. I wouldn't fade him. I think I think you could say that, hey, he's 37%. You want to get to 25 or 30%. That's reasonable. I would not fade him if you're playing multiple lines. I think it's sure, it's certainly somebody in Kate Cunningham who justifies having some exposure. Uh, but I'll ask you, Terry, uh, do you have any opinions on JaVale McGee or Will Barton? I think it's actually was Banton. I think it's Delano it Banton. There's been a little bit of chatter about him in our uh, Discord through the day. Uh, I think Banton is a non-play. Uh, Alex Housen projected at 17 minutes. I guess he got a little additional run uh, last night or the night before, whenever the last game was, and put up a few points. But uh, it looked like I pulled it up on Popcorn Machine real quick earlier, and it looked like he got a little bit of late run. Um, and I didn't see anybody that was in foul trouble. I couldn't really figure out where the run came from, and it was a close game. So maybe maybe we're wrong maybe he sees 25 30 minutes to 28 minutes we've got him projected at 17 i'm trusting our numbers he's a non-factor at 17 minutes so i'm not going to go there 3600 on FanDuel, 3000 on dk if you want to take a couple shots sure it's not difficult to get over the field which is projected for 0.3 percent ownership even if he comes in five percent owned it's not that difficult to get beyond that uh, JaVale McGee, let me pull him up over here. He was not really coming up much for me on FanDuel where he's a 3% optimal play. He's not owned at all. So you're getting positive leverage on him over there. He's a more optimal play at 3,300 at the center spot on the DK slate, a little bit more positive leverage, 8% optimal. So I can see getting to a little bit more McGee on the DK slate. Wasn't really a factor for me on FanDuel. All right. So I'm looking at the box score from last game. It was just, uh, so last night they just played precious limited minutes we saw precious achua only in the play 21 minutes and okay, they kind of went twofold so he played limited minutes ban played fairly well off the bench so that was why the minutes got there but with that said let's look at the entire season for ban and also we've seen uh, chris boucher has not really been as involved in the rotation this year as he was last year so Banton this year has played 12 minutes three minutes eight minutes five minutes 16 minutes 23 minutes last game the games where he played 12 minutes and 16 minutes, those were both a result of a blowout. The game against the Indiana Pacers, that was an 18-point game. The game against the Washington Wizards was a 15-point loss for the Toronto Raptors. So more often than not, the minutes have come from blowout time. And his overall per-minute production this year, about a fantasy point per minute, so that's all well and good. But once again, even if you get 22 minutes out of Banton, is 22 fantasy points going to be enough for him on a slate of this size? It, it wouldn't kill you, obviously. That would be a good value play. I don't know that lands in the optimal lineup, though. So uh, I agree. I think that Banton's minutes should regress a little bit this for, for this slate. And already we're looking at thin minutes. So I don't have Banton in my player pool. Uh, but like-minded minds could uh, feel a little bit differently about him. Uh, here's one kind of off-the-wall type value play that I don't think people are going to be getting to. And I'm going to refresh the ownership to make sure it still isn't the case. Uh, so most recent run of ownership, yeah, too, actually. we have, okay. So the, we, we don't have a most recent one as of yet, but Trey Murphy, the third is projected for, uh, just 3% ownership today on DraftKings at, uh, 3,300 over on FanDuel at 3,700. He's projected for less than 1% ownership. There's a massive void to fill in the Pelicans offense now that Brandon Ingram's out and Josh Hart is going to be starting in, in place of Ingram. But even with that said, I think that we could see Murphy play fairly significant minutes off the bench. Murphy is a rookie who's looked fairly good when he's been on the court so far this year. It's a tough matchup against the New York Knicks, but Murphy's minutes and comparing him to somebody like, uh, like um, uh, who, who we, I forgot who we were just talking about already. We were talking about uh, a, a Delano. Yeah, we were, ta we were talking about uh, about Delano before. Is 
the minutes have been there more consistently for Trey Murphy. Trey Murphy's played in the last two games, 22 minutes, 26 minutes. The game before he played 20 minutes, 22 minutes, 25 minutes. So he's somebody who's already playing north of 20 minutes more often than not. And now we're taking one of the key pieces of the Pelicans rotation, Brandon Ingram, off the court. I don't think that means that we're all, that there's a lock that Murphy plays 30-plus minutes, but I think there's potential for him to end up playing 30-plus minutes. And that's enough for me to want to get to him at 3,300 on drafting. He's also a no ownership. So uh, we do have Josh Hart starting, but still, I actually really like Murphy as a low-owned value play. Uh, do you have any opinion on him? Yeah, I think as a low own mix and match play, particularly, I mean, we won't know in advance, of course, but particularly, yeah, if he does coast over that 30 minute mark with them severely depleted for this game, then I think it's a really nice play in terms of getting to some potential value. Needs to make some shots. He's a 541 true shooting percentage on the season, only a 4.5% assist share, 4.7% rebounding rates uh, so far across uh, 22.1 minutes per game, only was seeing 10.6% usage so far. That's turned into uh, 0.44 fantasy points per minute. So it hasn't been a monstrous performance for him so far, but I think it's there for him in terms of talent. And certainly if he gets the minutes tonight, there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't happen for him. A little bit of an unpredictable rotation in terms of how much we're going to see Nah, how much we're going to see a guy like, you know, Najee Marshall, some of these other guys you mentioned, uh, Hart is going to be getting the start in that spot. Certainly some upside for him on the board as well. The guy that I'm getting the most frequently off this team is, uh, is Jonas Valanciunas again in the middle. Very, very optimal on both sites. I still think he's underpriced, not as severely underpriced as he's been, but still definitely some value there. So despite the little bit of negative leverage on the FanDuel site, I'm getting to a ton of uh, J-Val again in this spot. But yeah, I think in in just mixing and matching some of these guys, uh, some of the wings um, on this team, I think just makes a lot of sense. So uh, yeah, getting to different combinations of these value plays from the Pellies makes some sense here, despite tough matchup against my Knicks. All right, super chat here from Slick Messi saying, love the show. Most importantly, love my wife who's tuned in to her first NBA DFS slate. Let's go. First of all, I hope this is a winning slate first so she gets off to a, uh, a, yeah. a good start here. But also, uh, 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 welcome to the show. Thank you for watching. Do us a favor, like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you can watch it more than one because we, we don't only have NBA covered here. There's also baseball football, college football, MMA, soccer, hockey. We've got everything covered on the YouTube channel. So you guys want to be liking and subscribing to the channel. Uh, let's see. In terms of other guards here that I'm getting to uh, overweight, uh, wh what is your opinion on Jalen Suggs? Because Jalen Suggs to this point this year is somebody who I've been looking to have some positive shooting regression. His, his season to this point has been pretty disappointing as a top overall pick. And it's not because the minutes haven't been there. They certainly have. The usage has been there. He came into last game, though, shooting sub 30% from the field, and we finally saw him shoot a little bit better. It still wasn't great. He shot 6 of 14 last game, but we start to see that when a player like Jalen Suggs is going to play around 30 minutes with a usage rate in the mid-20s, he doesn't have to be massively efficient to pay off the relatively cheap salaries that he's had so far on FanDuel and DraftKings. So I'm still riding Jalen Suggs. I like to get to him until the price goes up. I don't think he's going to be massively efficient, but I don't think he continues to be a guy who only shoots 30% from the field. So Jalen Suggs is another player that I like quite a bit, also going up against the Detroit Pistons team that uh, also not, uh, not super talented. So should be a, a game that we could count on for being closer than most Magic games. But is Jalen Suggs something you like getting to today? Yeah, um, starting to sweat the ownership a little bit. He's gone up to 39.4%. The ownership just updated, by the way, if you want to grab it. So it's at 39.4% on the FanDuel slate now, which is pushing his, uh, his leverage score uh, pretty aggressively. But I've got a ton of them in the base of lineups that I built. I'm going to run another crunch in the next few minutes, see how he comes up in that one. But I expect I'm going to have a good mix of him. And I've been throughout this early part of the season, I've been getting to a lot of these pieces from the magic, be it Cole Anthony from time to time, be it Terrence Ross, which hasn't really worked out all that well. Franz Wagner's given us a, a decent uh, run at a cheap price on the FanDuel slate as well at the small forward and shooting guard spot. So I think there's a lot of mix and match pieces in this lineup and I've been getting to them decently. They haven't totally burnt me yet. Um, so I'm going to be riding one way or another. A lot of these guys are going to be in a lot of my lineups. Um, so I was getting to Ross again tonight. I'll see what uh, it looks like Chumo Kike is uh, now projected to be in. Uh, I think we got that news a, a few minutes before we came on. Alex mm -hmm. hasn't projected around 16 minutes, so that might slice into some of the upside for, uh, for some of these other wings. So we'll see what that does uh, in terms of where the, uh, where the minutes go and where the usage goes. But I don't really sweat that in terms of a guy like Suggs, of course. But for some of the other mix and match pieces, it might take a little bit of a dip uh, in, in what they're doing here. 
but I'll definitely have a lot of these guys. Oh, and the other guy that I didn't mention, of course, Smobamba, who I also get a ridiculous amount of through the early part of the season, at least in crunches. And then we see where it comes out based on the ownership, based on the leverage when I do my sorting here. So going to be a lot of magic again tonight. Yeah, and I think Mo Bamba is the player who could be negatively impacted the most by Chuma Kiki entering the rotation, but it's not enough to keep me away from playing Mo Bamba, particularly on Fandor, where he's only 6,400. And last game, Mo Bamba actually played 39 minutes. He's always been a guy who's just an insane points for a fantasy producer. So even if Mo Bamba maybe plays a few less minutes, it, it still wouldn't make him a poor play, but maybe just tempered expectations a little bit from where there have been previously. It's where we've gotten to 50% of Mo Bamba and you know, maybe it's just a few less lineups with them. Oh, we do have some super chats here to uh, catch up on. Uh, three of them here, actually. First, Justin Bruce is asking best thirty-eight and best thirty-eight hundred and underplay on DK. No, no position asked. So, just generally, who is the best for thirty-eight hundred and under uh, on the chalk end? That is still going to be Cade Cunningham for me. If you wanted to go with a lesser-owned option. Let's see, who do I projected for the most fantasy points under 3,800 other than Cade Cunningham? Um, I guess it would be Trey Murphy the third for me at that point, uh, just because I, I also, for, for the lower ownership, but my answer is going to be Cade Cunningham at 3,600. I don't really think there's anybody else around him that I really love from utility perspective, but I know you were a little bit lower on Cade Cunningham than I was, Terry. Is there somebody under 3,800 that you like for a single entry D, uh, GPP on DK more than Cunningham? Uh, let me see. I was just dropping in the latest update here for our uh, our old boom bus tool, and I'll see what uh, comes up in terms of where the pricing is. See if anything changed in terms of the optimal rate. That's usually what I like to go by when I'm making that decision between a couple of guys. It's unfortunate we don't have something to spend in the four thousand range. Uh, like I said earlier, I like the four thousand spots a little bit better on the DK slate. So like if you could get up to forty one hundred even for Terrence Ross, I think there's a little bit of upside there if he has a hot shooting night. Thirty eight hundred, uh, boy. JaVale is on the board at 33, getting him decently optimal, decently positively leveraged. I don't love it because he's a low overall projection. He's only a 15 minute projection on the night, but certainly a guy who can put up a handful of uh, fantasy points in that 15 minutes, 1.19 fantasy points per minute for the season, 1.24 last season. I don't love it, but uh, he's a little bit higher in Alex's board than Cade Cunningham, a few spots further down. All right. Uh, here is the next super chat here from Bat Jones 22. Kevin Knox and Kevin S for uh, Obi Topin or Obi Toppin and Patrick Beverly. So uh, Kevin Unless... Kevin S, I, I believe that we're once again referring to our friend in the uh, in in YouTube chat, Kevin S. Uh, and although the last time I thought somebody was re was referring to a uh, uh, Kevin S, and it ended up being uh, somebody who is an actual player, but. Uh, Kevin S, just because just because I, I love Kevin S when he posts on the YouTube channel, I assume that this is Bat Jones 22. This is an alter ego for Kevin S. I'm going to say play Kevin S, although all those guys today, uh, in particular Kevin Knox, really sucks. But either way, Kevin Knox and Kevin S uh, load up on the Kevins today. Yeah, unless several of the Knicks were injured in a bus crash on the way to the arena, just don't play Kevin Knox under any circumstances. I mean, he's yeah, he's a non-factor. Uh, Obi, I think gets you know enough minutes where if he's super cheap, you can get you can get to him in certain spots, but definitely not a uh, not a play for me today. All right, the next question that we have here from oh, this isn't even a question. This is just a a nice well wisher upfront fanatic is saying appreciate the whole awesome team and we appreciate you. Thank you for uh, leaving us a super chat. Uh, any other guards here that we haven't hit on that are core pieces of your build that you think we should be mentioning here, Terry? Uh, let me see here on the uh, you know FanDuel slate if we haven't touched on anybody. I touched on Deonta Murray. Uh, I touched on Kyle Lowry. I like those two guys quite a bit. Sorting by Alex's optimal rate, sorting by my uh, on-target scores, I get both of them uh, in a good handful of my lineups here when I'm doing my sort. Jimmy Butler, similar story. We've talked about him. Steph Bears mentioning again. Um, are you getting to any Fred Van Vliet? I feel like he's kind of in the middle of the board. He's in kind of like a price limbo. Hasn't been great. Hasn't been what really I expected with the additional focus for him this year. Only 0.95 fantasy points per minute. Uh, 0.514 5, uh, true shooting percentage. 31.5% assist share, but only a 5.9% rebound. It's kind of who he is. I feel like the shot needs to start falling a little bit more for him and just not coming up that much for me. Are you getting any of him on the, on the DK slate or on Fandle? 
No, so I'm looking at my projection right now. It's fairly similar on both sites, right around 37 and a half fantasy points, which had an 8,200 price tag on FanDuel and then DraftKings. He is at uh, 8,100. It's just not enough of a proje- projection, especially on a 10 game slate where there's so many good plays to go to. Uh, so I'm not also that he's a little bit popular right now. We have him projected for 10% ownership on DraftKings. FanDuel, he's projected for 16% ownership. So that's a pretty thin play for me. Uh, obviously, Fred Van Fleet, I think there is potentially some assumed upside just because, you know, there's no Kyle Lowry for them this year. Pascal Siakam isn't playing, but it's not like the usage rate has been massively high for him so far this year. So reading off his usage rates, 16.5%, 25.5% in the last three games, 22, 23, 22. It's not like he's become a massive usage player. He's just been a guy who's been a little bit less efficient because he doesn't have as good of weapons around him. So uh, that's a no on me for Fred Van Fleet. Based on what we've seen, I think he might be a little bit overpriced. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm thinking in terms of just yet yeah, where his price is puts him in a in a limbo kind of a situation where we've got higher price guys that we like better, and we've got a lot of lower price guys that we like a lot better on both sites. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something sl- with him slipping through the cracks because he is. You know, he's not in the top end of Alex's board, but he's certainly not near the bottom either. He's solidly in the middle. It's just that price that I think is keeping him out of a lot of lineups and certainly a guy we've seen, you know, light up the scoreboard in the past. So I thought it was at least worth mentioning bringing up another guy that's similar to that is DeMar DeRozan, but again, kind of just in a price limbo for me for his upside uh, 7,500. You get him at shooting guard and small forward. He was coming up a little bit more than Van Vliet for me, 7,700 small forward only. Uh, wasn't really coming up when I ran DK crunches earlier, but a little bit better of a fan duel play. Would you be getting to any DeMar? Those are the two. The other two. Uh, so DeMar DeRozan. Uh, so the biggest issue I have with DeRozan is the matchup. I very rarely like to play players going up against the Utah Jazz unless, you know, it's a great price or a great matchup. And I'm still not sure what to make of the Chicago Bulls usage overall because it's such a loaded team where, you know, you've got Alonzo Ball, you've got DeMar DeRozan, you've got Nikola Vucevic, you've got Zach Levine. And I don't mean loaded in terms of this is a team that I expect is going to compete for a championship, but it's loaded from a standpoint of there's a lot of good fantasy producers. It's a lot of guys that eat up a lot of usage. And I just don't know that there's enough space there really for everybody to eat from a fantasy perspective until the prices adjust a little bit. So pulling these guys up over on DraftKings, for instance, to start, we've still got Vucevic at 8,800. We've still got Levine at 8,200. DeMar DeRozan, 7,700. Lonzo Ball is 7,600. Those are really substantial price tags for those guys in a matchup against the Utah Jazz. And then heading over to FanDuel, there's a little bit more reason over price tag on Lonzo Ball at 6,700, which I guess you can make a case makes him playable, although I'm not getting to him. Then you got some Rosen at 7,500, Levine at 84, Vucevic at 87. It, it's just not favorable enough price tags for me to want to roster these guys. Yeah, and I think that's part of it too is, is just, you know, we don't exactly know how it's going to all shake out in the end. And maybe some of these guys do see start seeing an uptick in usage and, and a little bit more attention. But with so many mouths to feed in that offense – it doesn't really make sense for me. They're also a low pace team, uh, one of the lower marks on the board. So yeah, just wasn't a spot that was coming up a lot for me, but another one, like I said, wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something going through the cracks there. All right. And we did just get an ownership update. So I want to, I want to roll through some of the most rostered players uh, in the most recent ownership update over on DraftKings. The chalk is TJ McConnell at 24.9%, which once again, is not really a problematic number. We've had Kate Cunningham dip all the way to 19.3% ownership projected now. So earlier in the show, Terry, we talked about Cade Cunningham on DraftKings. Your main point of contention with him was just you thought he was too popular, projected for over 30% ownership. Does your does your opinion on him change now that we had a, a, a fresh ownership update where he's sub 20%? Yeah, I think that's going to have to uh, put him a little bit more on the board for me in terms of, uh, of DraftKings lineups. Fortunately, I'm not going to have to make many changes because I'm not building anything for DraftKings. But yeah, that's going to change uh, the amount of, uh, of leverage we get on him and, uh, and a lot of different things about that play. So for value, I do like that play. Still have those concerns about what the minutes are going to look like, but he doesn't have to do a ton at his price uh, for the minutes. So with the, with the ownership coming down a little bit, definitely I like that a lot more. All right, and now looking at uh, some Super Chats we have here. First, Big Money NJ. Once again, no question, just saying thanks, for the thanks, gents, for the content. Once again, appreciate you, you, Big Money NJ. We appreciate the Super Chat. And Brandon Lane is asking, do you guys like Derek Favors as a value play today? And, you know, actually, I've, I've rostered uh, a fair amount of, of uh, Derek Favors in, in best ball leagues this year just because it looks like he was going to be starting games for the Thunder. In hindsight, I wish I would have gotten to less of him as a flyer at the end of the draft because I just don't I don't see any kind of situation where it looks like he's ever going to end up uh, filling roster spots for me. 
Derek Favors, the issue, just the minutes haven't been there. And you know, he's still an okay points from a fantasy producer, but his playing time this year, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 19 minutes, he did play 26 minutes last game. Uh, but overall, I, I don't think that we could expect too much ceiling from Derek Favors. He's kind of a low floor, medium ceiling type play for me. So I don't really like Favors. Do you feel any differently? No, not really on the board for me very much. I mean, the, the 3300 price on DK, I guess you can justify him a little bit, but he's getting more ownership than his optimal rate over there. We're talking about a guy averaging 0.85 fantasy points per minute for the season so far, and we've only got him projected for 18 and a half minutes. Make of that what you will. Uh, I don't think that's a great play. All right. And by the way, just because people are bringing up Cade Cunningham, uh, there is a minutes limit for Cade Cunningham. Anybody who missed early in the show, we talked about it. I currently expect him to play 24 minutes. I think the number that we saw earlier was that he's expected to play 20 to 25 minutes. He is starting, which leads me to think he's going to be more on the high side of those minutes than the low side, just because there's more opportunity for him to play an extra stint or two when he's going to be starting as opposed to coming off the bench. So my logic earlier with Cade Cunningham is I have him projected for 24 minutes. I think he's a guy that scores over fantasy point per minute this year. Therefore, it's reasonable to expect somewhere in the neighborhood of mid-20s fantasy points from him. And then you consider on DraftKings how cheap his salary is at 3600 That's what makes him viable to me. The main point of contention that Terry had earlier, which I thought was a reasonable one, is that he was projected to be massively popular when we first started the show. We had him projected to be the most rostered player on the slate by a really wide margin at nearly 40% at that time, but that's not the case anymore. Now we have him projected for sub-20, so uh, that's the logic on, on Cade Cunningham. But uh, let's talk about forwards, and in particular, I want to talk about Giannis as a payup option because for me... If I'm only spending up for one player on the slate, whether it be FanDuel or DraftKings, the option for me, the guy I want to go to, is Giannis and Tetsukupo. Is he also your favorite payup option today? With a bullet. I have a massive amount of Giannis. I'm actually looking through my sort right now, kind of manipulating a few things on the back end to just you know force up a couple more of the mid-range guys, a couple more of the value guys. I'm not touching Giannis. He is the number one owned player in my, on my board here. And I love the spot. I think it makes all the sense in the world. We're talking about a guy who's averaging 1.85 fantasy points per minute this season, a 608 true shooting percentage, 35.1% assist share, 17.5% rebound. What's not to like about getting to as much Giannis as you possibly can coming up 31% optimal on the FanDuel slate, 19% optimal on the DK slate among the top two or three guys on both, on both sites. I don't really care about the negative leverage. I'm happy to pay up for it and, uh, and get to Giannis. You got multi, multi-position eligibility, different spots on both sites, power forward, small forward on, uh, on FanDuel, power forward center on DK. You know, I love that you can move them around the board and mix and match them in different ways with different players. We talked about all the value guards. So just swapping a lot of those guys around two different positions while you move Giannis to different positions and mixing other guys in between all those plays, I think is the, the absolute go-to approach for this slate. So he's my favorite play on the slate. Yeah, and I also think as a payup option, you could viably get to Nikola Jokic. Uh, I just if you're just choosing between the two, if you're playing one lineup, and need somebody to pay up for. The answer is Giannis for me. Maybe a little bit of concern. This is the tail end of a back to back for Jokic. He was listed as questionable to play yesterday. Ended up playing. He is on the injury report list as probable. So not that I expect him to miss, but maybe enough for him to play a couple less minutes on the tail end of a back to back. Uh, another question in our premium Slack chat. This one from Mister Moneybags again saying thoughts on Shake Milton for a DK GPP. I, I have no interest in Milton. Milton's expected to remain on a minutes restriction right now, and it's not like he's the best fantasy producer in the world as is. So no Shake Milton for me. And Terry, I'm going to assume the same for you. And yeah. we yeah, have- I think just we had a news report from just this afternoon where they were just basically saying he's not ready for major minutes. And yeah, it wouldn't be on the board for me. All right, we've got a uh, tall tale in our premium discord chat. He's saying, should he get a Minnesota player in a bring back in the $40 single entry? So he posted his lineup in there. I don't know if you could see it, Terry, but no, I, I don't worry too much about correlation and trying to stack individual teams or players for a 10 game uh, NBA slate. I think it, you're, you're really just looking to play. These are the guys I think project the best. These are the best value plays. These are the best spend up options. I don't worry too, too much about correlation unless it's, you know, a breaking point for a tie in between a couple of, of, uh, of plays. Uh, another super chat here from uh, Aiden Queskin saying, how do you feel about pairing Giannis with DeJounte Murray? So we just talked about Giannis. I really, really do like Giannis for today. Uh, DeJounte Murray, though, is not somebody that I'm really getting to that much. Just I mean, his price tag has gone up so much at this point. And I think he's a viable candidate for most improved player of the year. He's off to a really good start this year. He's had some really big fantasy games, 
But we're not talking about somebody who's priced well up to $8,500 on DraftKings. And if you just look at his recent games, well, look, he scored 71 fantasy points against the Lakers. Sure, that was an overtime game. He had 51 and a half fantasy points against the Mavericks also. But overall, I mean, I think we're going to see DeJounte Murray probably settle in as a guy who averages somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 fantasy points per game. So no real value for me in DeJounte Murray's salary. But is he somebody that you like today? I do, actually. I think we're getting a good amount of positive leverage on him on both sides, which I like from a guy who can deliver. He doesn't have to give me 70 fantasy points tonight, right? If he gives me 55, I'm pretty happy even at 8,600, 8,500. And I think that price is effectively keeping a lot of people off of him. So I do actually like that. I like the multi-position on uh, the FanDuel site where you get him point guard and shooting guard, move him around the board a little bit. We're talking about a guy 1.31 fantasy points per minute for the season, 32.8% assist share. He's got those 1.31 fantasy points per minute with just a 451 true shooting percentage as well. So, I mean, if he starts making a couple more buckets, we could actually see a bit of an increase in his production here, seeing 24.3% usage, 35.2 minutes. There's a lot to like about it. I think we might see his price creep up above the 9,000 mark before it's all said and done, at which point then I might be bailing out. But we'll see what the, uh, what the slate thinks of it at that point. Right now, I like the leverage on him. Interesting. So I'm, um, I guess I'm just a little bit lower on DeJounte Murray than you. And I don't think he's going to be a guy who ends up being priced over 9,000. I think we see his price take a step back this year instead of, a, uh, instead of a step forward, but you know, okay. I could certainly be wrong. And he could be somebody that I'm just too light on from a points per minute perspective entering the season. Uh, well, let's hit on some of these other popular forward plays and uh, time went really quick here, answering all those super chats yes, and the well. questions we got. So uh, just kind of a general overview of the forwards. These are the ones that I'm getting the most exposure to today across FanDuel and DraftKings. Uh, 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 once again, I think that Mo, uh, Mo Bamba is somebody who just becomes unavoidable on FanDuel. Power forward and center eligibility at 6,400. Such a good points from a fantasy producer. Last night, he played 39 minutes. I don't expect him to play 39 minutes again, but even if we're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 minutes from Mo Bamba, he's going to be a core play for me. Uh, Bam Adebayo, who you mentioned before, also we talked about him being questionable. But uh, he's still officially listed as questionable, but warming up on the court and reportedly trending towards playing. So I really like Bam Adebayo. And then Miles Turner, who's power forward and center eligible on FanDuel. He gets the biggest usage bump on the entire Pacers team when there is no Malcolm Brogdon on the court. So yesterday we saw Miles Turner put up a pretty decent FanDuel game in 32 minutes, scored 31.8 FanDuel points, only 5,600. So once again, I really like Miles Turner. Uh, anything there you disagree with or any other forwards that you would really like to add to the mix? Well, those were like my uh, my three go-to forwards when I built my lineups earlier in the day. Not much has changed through the sort. That was when I was hand-building. Those are three guys in my hand-built placeholder, and uh, I'm not going to change that much. Uh, just taking a look at some of the guys I've gotten to in lower shares, some of the mix-and-match pieces. Uh, on the FanDuel slate in particular, I've got some shares, it looks like, of Aaron Gordon popping in here. I assume that's just because he's probably still pretty cheap. I'll pull him up right now. Uh, yeah, still sitting at 5,200, 12% optimal in Alex's numbers, coming up with a little under 30 point uh, median projection on the FanDuel site, but a nice 26.9% boom, boom score probability has only given us 0.82 fantasy points per minute so far this season. I think there's a little bit more talent than that on the board, and that's with an 8.3% assist there and 11.4% uh, rebounding rate. So there's more talent than that in Aaron Gordon. So I don't mind getting uh, to some increased shares of him a little bit over the field on him. Um, taking a look around, we uh, touched on uh, Sabonis a little bit earlier, but I think he's certainly worth uh, worth bringing into the conversation. 9,100 is one of the more expensive plays at the forward spot on the board. Coming up pretty frequently optimal on both sides. So he's a guy that I like to mix and match, but that's a spot where you're talking about, do I want to get Sabonis? Do I want to get to Bam? Do I want to get Sabonis? Do I want to get to Giannis? And you're starting to make some of those decisions. So out of those three, he's the guy at the bottom of that list for me, but I think he's definitely based on his optimal rate on both sites, over 10% optimal, getting positive leverage on both sites. Always a guy I'm willing to go to, always interesting. So definitely uh, getting to uh, some Sabonis. Uh, taking a look, you talked about Mo. Uh, I was getting some shares of Michael Porter on the uh, FanDuel slate, which is interesting. I haven't gotten much of him this year, but another guy above a 10%, uh, a, above a 10% optimal rate and coming up with a nice positive leverage on that slate. So I'm getting to uh, some Michael Porter Jr. here as well. Yeah, I've been playing a lot of Michael Porter Jr. this year, and it's gone very poorly. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I, st I still like him going forward. He's still a guy that I think should have a pretty high usage rate, especially with Jamal Murray out and should start to produce. Uh, the results have been just baffling for me. I don't, I don't really have anything I could point to that really makes it make sense. He's not taking shots very often this year. And when he is taking shots, they're not going in. 
Yeah. But usage rates so far for Michael Porter Jr., 16.9, 17.7, 25.3, 22, 26. So certainly less than I was expecting from a shooting perspective. And he's not delivering in other categories. So uh, definitely some worrying things, but one of the more talented young players in the NBA and certainly one of the better scorers in the league overall. So uh, I think he ultimately figures it out. I don't mind getting to him at low ownership. And uh, once again, I think all that money reason- from the contract is weighing him down early in the season. But yeah, 447 true shooting percentage, 9.3% assist share, 7.8% rebounding rate, 0.78 fantasy points per minute. I'm concerned about the shares of uh, lineups that I'm giving to Michael Porter. I'm more concerned about the shares of lineups that are going to have Michael Porter and Terrence Ross in them. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, once again, I, I think he's a good GPP play. I wouldn't go out yeah. and play 20, 30 percent of them, but being no, no. you know three, four x the field, I think is uh, certainly justifiable at, at fairly low ownership. Uh, and I want to also bring up. Uh, did we have one? Other, I thought there was one other super chat on this, but no, I guess not. I, I guess we hit all of them. Uh, any other forwards here that are going to be key pieces of your build that we've not yet mentioned? If not, we'll head on over to uh, some of the big men. No, you touched on Miles Turner. He's definitely a key for me, but uh, somebody you talked about, uh, just looking down my board here, nobody that's going to be in more than like 8% of my lineups, like Evan Mobley's creeping into like 6%. Jordan Noir is getting a little bit with Drew Holiday out. I think he might see a little bit of an uptick, but uh, nobody, uh, Pat Connaught in similar, uh, similar kind of ownership. He's a small shooting guard, small forward on the FanDuel slate. Um, so nobody really jumping into massive shares. I've got a little bit of Jeremy Grant. I've got a little bit of Chris Middleton, who's got small forward eligibility on FanDuel, a little bit of Scotty Barnes, but nobody significant. All right. Uh, the slate might, might lock in six minutes, but Terry and I are not actually going anywhere. We're going to be sticking around for 30 minutes after lock to talk about prize picks who is sponsoring our show. If you guys are not familiar with prize picks, they do have prop based daily fantasy sports contest. And we're going to be covering some of the best props that you could play over on prize picks. But most importantly, if you are new to the site, head on over there and use the promo code Osmo. They get you a $100 bonus on your first deposit. So up to a hundred dollars. If you're a new user over prize picks, make sure you use that promo code Osmo. Uh, they also have a uh, an app you could download in the, in the App Store or the Google Play Store. So check that out as well. Uh, but let's hit on the center position here to uh, close out at least the uh, lock before we get to the main slate. And in terms of payoff option, I want to ask, what do you make of Nicole Jokic and Carl Anthony Towns? Because I think both of them individually project pretty well. However, I'm making I'm, I'm finding it a little difficult to get to them just because of how much I'm prioritizing paying up for for Giannis. Now, with that said, we have Cat only projected for 1% ownership on FanDuel, so that's a number that's not difficult to get over the top of. But Jokic and and Carl Anthony Towns, are these players that you're getting too much today? Not as much as I probably should be or would want to be um, just if I was sitting here building lineups without being on a show uh, and talking to everybody. So I'll probably be a little underweight to where I would normally be comfortable on them on this slate. They're both positively leveraged looking at the FanDuel board. Looks like the same is true across town on DK. Uh, And like you mentioned, you're talking about very low on Carl Anthony Towns in particular, under 2% ownership on the FanDuel slate, Uh, similarly low on the DK slate, uh, under 10% on the DK slate, I should say. So getting a little leverage, but you're not getting either one of them all that frequently optimal. And I think it's just a product of what we talked about before, where a lot more of the money is getting spent in the forward spots. And then we're getting a little bit of a discount, getting the like the mid-range centers, where for me, it's uh, a lot of Mo Bamba, a lot of Miles Turner, a lot of Jonas Valanciunas, like I mentioned, some DeMontis. A bonus in there, some BAM in there. These guys are a little bit less expensive than Jokic and a little bit less expensive than Towns. So they're just eating up a lot of those shares. Could either Towns or Jokic blow through the top of all those guys and the entire slate? Absolutely. Both those guys can tear the top off of a slate. I'm not going to be there as much as I'd like to be. But that said, I don't think it makes sense to force like, you know, if the field's going to be at around 10% on uh, Jokic, I don't think it makes sense to force like 25. I think maybe it makes sense to increase and go to 15, 18, something like that. But I don't know that you want to get him into a quarter of your lineups. I don't think he's going to be frequently enough optimal and you're not getting a massive amount of leverage on him. Uh, and we do have some, uh, we do have some news here that uh, we had the news guy himself just DM me is that Damian Lee, has been ruled out for today. It looks like the, uh, at least per the uh, report here, the Warriors are expected to give a little bit more minutes to guys like Jordan Poole, uh, Chris Chioza, Moses Moody. It doesn't really change anything significantly for me. Damian Lee was not somebody I was going to be rostering. And I don't know this is now going to make any other player that I really want to get to. Also, the Golden State Warriors favored by 12 and a half points. Uh, this is one of the first games of the year where I really think there's a whole significant amount of blowout risk once we get to a 12 and a half point spread. So 
I'm a little bit concerned about some of the minutes for guys like maybe uh, uh, Draymond Green or Jordan Poole here anyway, but anything that opens up for you meaningfully with Damian Lee being out? No, I wasn't really getting so much pool and it doesn't look like I'll, I'll get to all that much more. Like if I bump him from the 28.6 that Alex had him projected for give him like 32 or something like that. I don't think it's going to make a significant enough change at 0.92 fantasy points per minute for him. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to change all that much. I'll still try and get to some Steph Curry shares where I can get them and I'll take a little bit of dream on, but I'd be concerned about the minutes in a blowout for both of those guys. Wiggins, probably a similar story. Maybe it makes me like Wiggins a little bit more, but the ownership is all wonky on him. He's negatively leveraged on both sides. So I don't think I'd be pressing to very much of any of these, uh, of these Warriors players, really. All right. And any other centers? And I know we only have 90 seconds here, so maybe not the most actionable information in the world, although there is late swap for NBA and we're going to be sticking around for 30 minutes anyway, but any value centers that are really making it into your player pool meaningfully? No, most of my centers were coming out of that mid-range, like we've talked about a a couple times on the slate. So uh, I'm just taking a quick peek over at the DK side of the board here. Um, For me, a guy, I mean, he qualifies as a value play. So I I think if somebody out there is looking for a cheap center, Miles Turner, 5,600 on the FanDuel slate, 5,600 on the DK slate. I think he makes a lot of sense as a center on both sides. You can get to him. He's negatively leveraged, but it's one of those high optimal, uh, high uh, boom score probability rates that I don't really mind for the price getting to some of him. So that's my call there for a uh, somewhat value center. All right. And I'm just going to refresh the ownership, see if anything crazy has popped up. Nope. We don't have any uh, fresh ownership. One guy we'll shout out is Wendell Carter Jr. Uh, just because there's so much ownership that's going to Mo Bamba. And I've actually been rostering some Wendell Carter Jr., just for some leverage purposes in terms of like, hey, if Mo Bamba gets into foul trouble or something happens with him, Wendell Carter Jr. stands to benefit the most. And even with Bamba playing well, Wendell Carter Jr. is still playing fairly well. He's actually scored at least 33 DraftKings points in four of the last five games. So Wendell Carter Jr. I think remains a little bit underpriced. So that is somebody who I like a little bit as a leverage play when you consider, especially over on FanDuel, Mo Bamba currently projected for now 35% ownership whereas Wendell Carter Jr. only projected for 9% ownership. So that's something where I don't have these guys. I've, I've Bamba projected better, but not to the point where I think he's, you know, 4X more likely to land in the optimal lineup. So Wendell Carter Jr., that is somebody who I like a little bit for those reasons. Did you did you roster him at all? Yeah, I've got him. Uh, it's a little bit below where the field is uh, for the FanDuel slate, but I do have him in some shares. Uh, and I think I just lost some shares probably to uh, the price, 6,300. I was getting to more Miles Turner, who was cheaper. Um, but yeah, I do I do think for everything that you said there, it makes a lot of sense to get to at least some of them, particularly if you are rostering Mo Bamba pretty heavily. Put Wendell Carter in some of the other lineups where you're not going to Mo Bamba. All right, so that is going to bring us to lock. But like we said... We're not going anywhere. we got another 30 minutes for Terry and I to talk about basketball. This part of the show is going to be sponsored by Prize Picks. But once again, maybe you guys don't know if you're going to be playing on Prize Picks yet. Maybe you want to learn more information about it, or you just want to watch Terry and I talk more basketball. But don't think that just because you aren't playing on Prize Picks, there isn't anything in this portion of the show for you. Because if any kind of news happens, somebody gets scratched, there's some kind of injury situation that's unforeseen. Terry and I are also going to be breaking that down from a FanDuel and DraftKings perspective. So there should be a little bit of something for everybody also. We've got a couple of games going on. We've got the, we've got the New Orleans Pelicans against the Knicks. We've got the Pistons taking on the Magic. So anything that happens there, Terry and I could react to it. Maybe Kate Cunningham as a truck leg gets off to a great start. Maybe he struggles a little bit off the top. And uh, we could discuss that a little bit as well. But Terry, let's get into some of the prize picks now. And I'm pulling up the site right now. Do you have, do you have prize picks open for you right now? Uh, actually, I've got our uh, betting tool with all the props laid out where Alex puts his projection, the win expectancy, and the ROI. And that's how I like to go about making uh, making lineups for prize picks because it lays out everything you need to make a, make those decisions for you. So it's kind of our tool for that site. So that's what I'm looking at right here. So if you want to shout out what some of the lines are, I can look for where we've got them projected. I can look into my model, see if I've got anybody differently. We can go about it about that uh, that way. Or I can open another tab and pull up prize picks and, uh, and look through the site as well. Yeah, we could do it that way as well. So uh, also, I think there's something else to be said for that. Hey, maybe there's something here that looks way different on prize picks compared to traditional sports books that might make that may- look for a good bet. Or there could just be something where, you know, on, on, on prize picks, maybe something from a value perspective from NBA DFS that also looks good over on prize picks. And also... So prize picks, they have not just single, they, not just single stats where there's props for points, rebounds, assists, threes, free throw mains, but there's also fantasy scores. So you could also just as easily look at our fantasy project, projection and the, the, uh, the scoring system on prize picks 
is the exact same as the scoring system over on FanDuel. So you could also just look at our projections for FanDuel compared to prize picks and try to find some of the players to look at there. Uh, but would you rather look at the projections, Terry, for the total fantasy score or individual stats? I think we can, we can mix and match. I, I'm good to go with the either way. Do you have a okay. preference? No, not really. Uh, let's, let's look at some of the most popular plays today in terms of who is projected for the most ownership on FanDuel and DraftKings. And let's see what that means from a, from a from perspective over on prize picks. And I want to start by looking at TJ McConnell. So TJ McConnell, we know the situation with the Indiana Pacers where there's going to be no Malcolm Brogdon in the lineup today. Mal, uh, TJ McConnell figures to draw most of the point guard minutes. He is currently projected for 10 and a half points over on prize picks and assists at six and a half. Are either of those numbers something that stands out to you? So looking at our board where we had him, uh, the line when we did this was at 11 and a half and we had him at a uh, 65% win rate on the under for 11 and a half points. So it's coming down a little bit. That makes it a little bit closer, I would think. But uh, yeah, I think there's uh, certainly some, uh, some upside to go into that. What was the assist one? Uh, the assist is six and a half, which I think is, uh, that, let me see, what do I have in that? Six and a half, same, same, uh, same line on that. We had him at woof, tight one, 53% on the over. So that is really close. I don't know that that's one I would want to go to on prize picks. I think since we're picking, you know, a handful of these and putting them together into a lineup, I just like to trend toward those, uh, you know, 60% and above uh, uh, win expectancy ones. And we can get to a lot of win expectancy um, in the 70s and 80s on this board. So I don't think we need to dip down to that 50% level. All right. So how about this? Bring up, what is the number one projected prop? Obviously, for a game that has not yet started on, uh, in our player prop model. And then we'll compare that to what the number is over on prize picks. Um, let's see, uh, that game started, uh, there was an interesting one. We could have talked about Cade Cunningham, who's got a 79% win expectancy on the under for an 11 and a half points. Uh, but you want one that hasn't started yet. So uh, yeah, nothing, uh, nothing to do there. Yeah, nothing we can do on that. Uh, Jonas, Jonas Valanciunas, 73% to go over 17 and a half points. Let's see. So Jonas Valanciunas, he, no, that game, that game's already started. Damn it. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the schedule the, uh, in front of me, also. Yeah, no, that's um, the, so here's here. I'll rip, so the, there's two games that have started so far it is uh, Orlando and Detroit. So the Magic and Pistons are off the board, and the Pelicans and Knicks. So that game is off the board as well. All right, perfect. So looking at the assists board, uh, we've got uh, I'll skip over Aaron Gordon, who is the leader at 87% win expectancy on a one and a half assists line, which I do kind of like, willing, willing and uh, capable passer. But what do you think of Tyler Hero at four and a half? Uh, we've got that at a pretty decent win expectancy on the under. What do you think on, the, on that one? Uh, so Tyler Hero does not have an assist prop over, over oh. on prize picks. <laughs> so uh, I have no opinion on that. His teammate Kyle Lowry is here with a six and a half assist total. And I, I think there's a talking point here to be had about the overall outlook of the Miami Heat's offense where – I don't totally know what to expect from it now that Kyle Lowry's in the mix. One thing that we've seen happen with Bam Adebayo, his assist rate has plummeted this year. And one way that he's really delivered a lot of his fantasy value in previous years, not just for DFS, but also for season-long leagues, has been as a big man who's able to pass the basketball assist this year for Bam Adebayo, just 2-0-2-3-1. So uh, looking at Kyle Lowry anyway at, at, at six and a half assists, that kind of just made me think about uh, Bam out of bio because of that. But anyway, Kyle Lowry at six and a half assists. I know that we haven't been super high on Kyle Lowry at times in our projections, but is that something that, uh, that, that looks favorable at all in our prop model? That's another one, according to uh, Alex's numbers here in the prop model, it's another one. It's 56% win expectancy on the under. So either way that you play it, it's a little bit tricky in that spot where it's just kind of a coin flip. Uh, I, I like getting to uh, on prize picks, some of these more oh, high. And, win expectancy. Oh. All right, we've gotten it. Bam out of bio, ruled out. So awesome. everything everything goes out the window. Anything we just said about Bam out of bio doesn't even matter. And also, Karis LeVert is going to be starting. So the Pacers starting lineup, TJ McConnell, Karis LeVert, Chris Duarte, DeMontis Sabonis, Miles Turner. So it is Karis LeVert starting in place of Justin Holiday today. Uh, that is something that, whatever, that was reasonably expected. It doesn't really change that much. What does change a lot, actually what changes everything, is the Miami Heat situation with no Bam out of bio in there. And the news we had earlier, he was listed as questionable to play, but he was warming up. He looked good. He was reportedly trending towards playing. 
Not the case anymore. Bam Adebayo is out. So instant reaction, Terry. How does this impact the Miami Heat? Bump to Kyle Lowry and Jimmy Butler, who I was already getting to a significant amount for sure. Just, uh, you know, seeing those guys uh, taking the uh, the third banana out of that offense, so to speak. I think it's just natural that they'll see a little bit of an uptick. Um, thinking it through, I think we could see a little bit of an uptick for uh, Tyler Hero, just in terms of uh, being on the court, in terms of available minutes, in terms of available usage. I'm just trying to uh, get through some of my, uh, what I'm going to have to do with these lineups as I'm talking about this. So bear with me one sec. Um, I guess just in terms of available forwards uh, and centers, uh, Dwayne Dedman probably sees a few more minutes. We had him projected at 15 minutes and a 20-ish point projection. So a little bit of a bump there becomes kind of a value play, I guess, at 4,500 on FanDuel. I don't have him uh, at the DK salary in front of me. Go ahead. Yeah, so I was going to say, so uh, Dwayne Deadman, who has a salary of $3,200 on draft, he's now the best value play on DK, in my opinion. So Dwayne Deadman this year is playing 14.9 minutes per game, is averaging 16.55 DraftKings points. On the low end, assuming Dwayne Deadman starts, I think we're looking at 24 to 26 minutes from him. Just those kind of minutes is points per minute production. You're looking at nearly 30 fantasy points for Dwayne Dedman. So I really love Dedman. Even at the more elevated salary over on, on FanDuel, I'm still going to like Dedman. But DraftKings, that is a no-brainer plan. Something else to consider also with this news coming out eight minutes after lock and that we were expecting Bam Adebayo to play. Dedman is not going to pick up nearly as much ownership as he would have had this, had this news come out an hour ago. So Dwayne Dedman, to me, I say swap on to as much Dedman as you possibly can. Play him in cash games, play him in tournaments. Uh, Deadman is now the the best play on the slate. Yeah, at that price, absolutely home run spot. Uh, you know, a little bit less so, but like you said, it's still a, a very good value on the FanDuel board. Um, so I'm just looking at what we're going to be able to do in terms of the late swap. We've got the Toronto Indie game locking at 7:30, and we uh, we know that we wanted uh, maybe some some bonus, maybe some Miles Turner, both in the same positions as Bam. So I expect a lot of those shares will go that way if you just naturally push it through the optimizer. So it might be a situation where you want to take a look at what Deadman's projected for in the optimizer. Maybe give them a little bit of a nudge if you want to get to more of them if you're trying to late swap those before the 7.30 games lock. If you do it afterward, I expect he'd probably come up a little bit more naturally. That does also open up the opportunity to uh, maybe force a couple of the more high-end centers as well um, in terms of uh, a Jokic, a Carl Anthony Towns, where you can. Yeah, and... um... Uh, looking through, all right, so I'm pulling up the on-off court numbers for the Miami Heat, but I have to do it for, I guess I'll still do it for this year since the, the situation is so much different because they didn't have Kyle Lowry last year. So it's going to be hard to really pull too much information uh, from a Miami Heat team that didn't have Kyle Lowry last year. So I'll just look at small sample size, but better than nothing, see what happened this season when Bam Adebayo has been off the court and who's who benefited the most, obviously, like I said, from a value perspective, the answer is going to be Dwayne Dedman, assuming he starts. I don't think we got a starting lineup yet. And haven't seen it. No, just, uh, yeah, nothing there. No starting lineup, but all right. So here are the minutes this year. And by the way, here, here when, uh, when, when Bam Adebayo has been off the court this year, Dwayne Dedman, uh, 40.71 DraftKings points per 36 minutes. Other players, they're seeing a substantial boost in production with um, with Bam Adebayo off the court. We're looking at Tyler Hero with a 4% usage increase. That is the most of any player on the Heat. And then a modest usage increase to Jimmy Butler, 1.4%. So uh, I think that Tyler Hero now is somebody who just based on that information, once again, kind of a small sample size. He's only played 70 minutes this year with Bam Adebayo off the court. Uh, but even so, I think that as Tyler Hero being out with a 33.2% usage rate when there's no BAM on the floor, uh, I think that Tyler Hero really stands to gain a lot, even if it's not a direct benefit in terms of playing time. So does that all make sense to you with, with Tyler Hero? Yeah, for sure. With the increased usage, uh, particularly if it's a, a night where he comes out and that's, uh, that shot's falling a little bit, gets hot, that uh, could be a, a hammer play because, again, kind of like your point with Deadman, just not a lot of people are going to have gotten to that play. Um, as everybody's scrambling to replace out of bio and lineups with late swap, probably not one that leaps to mind for the casual player. So definitely, I think that's a, that makes sense. And probably another guy that you might want to give a little bit of a nudge if you're optimizing and, uh, and late swapping right now. Yeah. So uh, that's the, that's the news there that we have with Bam out of bio news that we were not expecting. Also all the, all the more reason why you wanted to stick around for this last uh, 30 minutes, because even if you aren't playing on prize picks, even if you don't know whether you're going to take advantage of that $100 bonus offer by using the promo code Awesome, which you should be using, 
We've got all kinds of other NBA DFS information covered here. Also, uh, new starting lineup for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Derek Favors was expected to start. That is no longer going to be the case as it is Jeremiah Robinson Earl starting at center for the Oklahoma City Thunder. So earlier in the show, somebody asked if Derek Favors was a good value play. Uh, the answer to me then was no. The answer to me is even more so no. And that we could have Dwayne Dedman for the same place on DraftKings, which is the way to go. So uh, any any opinion on Jane, uh, on Jeremiah Robinson Earl starting for the Thunder? Uh, my opinion is who? <laughs> Uh, yeah, which I wouldn't be going to favors. Uh, I, I don't think I'd be going to that spot. I can pull them up here real quick as I'm uh, talking it through. I'm just uh, lost so, in what I'm going to do with this. So uh, Jeremiah Robinson, Earl, he, he started a couple of days ago against the Warriors and didn't really do anything of note. It wasn't terrible from a fantasy perspective. He scored 21 DraftKings points in 27 minutes. Uh, but once again, doesn't seem like somebody's going to profile as a great points minute fantasy producer. So far this year in five games, he's playing 16 minutes per game, averaging 12 fantasy points in those minutes. If you go to the preseason where he's facing some weaker competition, he played 18 minutes per game and averaged 10.75 DraftKings points. So ultimately, this looks like a guy who's, you know, 0.7 or, or so points from a fantasy producer. And it, it's not likely that we're going to see him play substantial enough minutes to that low points per minute rate to ultimately end up paying off his price tag. Right. Yeah, have, have we caught 0. 0.68 was the average uh, of, of all those numbers that you said. So you nailed it with that quick math. <laughs> Uh, is, is there anything here from a news perspective that, that we should be talking about that we haven't hit yet? If not, we'll jump back over to prize picks and some of the props. Uh, just popping into our premium discord here where the news God posts all of that in our NBA breaking news channel, which is just awesome to not have to sort through a bunch of chat to get this stuff. Doesn't look like we talked about the Warriors news, um, which I, I don't really sweat all that much. Doesn't look like anything funky in the Hawks lineup that just got posted. So uh, I don't see anything here. Um, looks like uh, the OKC one just went into that channel. So yeah, nothing, not, nothing crazy. It's just going to be a matter of uh, what to do with all these BAM shares right now for me. And here's actually something we could do with the news that I, I should have thought of before. Let's look at the fantasy projections for the Miami Heat player, for the Miami Heat players over on prize picks and see which guys we want to get to now. Yeah with this Bam out of bio news, because it looks like the numbers here actually haven't updated. So Tyler Hero has an over-under of 30 fantasy points over on prize picks. We have Kyle Lowry, just 27 fantasy points. I like the overs on both those numbers. Once again, same scoring as FanDuel. Uh, do you like over 30 fantasy points for Hero and over 27 for Kyle Lowry? I would have to imagine that I would. Let me uh, just get over there. Yeah, we had him projected. We had Lowry projected at uh, 31 and change. Going in before that news, we had uh, Tyler Hero at 25.9. I think with the uptick for both of those guys, we're probably going to get there on those. So, yeah, I do like those. Uh, what I assume, did they not have Deadman on anything on the board? Just, you know, non-starter. Oh, I, I assume, I assume yeah. not. Um, yeah, if yeah. there is one, I would I would grab the, uh, the over as quickly as possible. Yeah, nothing on Deadman. Yeah. Jimmy Butler at 44, uh, maybe a little high, if anything, but I think it's a relatively reasonable number there on Jimmy Butler, but... Yeah, Kyle Lowry and Tyler Hero, I think those are both guys who make sense to get to the overs to Tyler Hero uh, in particular. Now, getting back to our premium Discord channel, there was another question just came in from our guy IRM who's saying, I bro, what do you think about the Raptors? Scotty, Trent, and OG are kind of fitting for me a lot. So I guess my question is, how many Raptors make sense for a DK single entry and cash? Uh, so for DraftKings, let me pull up the Toronto Raptors. And once again, those players, Terry, in case you missed them, that was Scotty Barnes, OG Ananobi, and Gary Trent. Um, I don't really love any of them. Uh, so Scotty Barnes so far this year has played really well from a fantasy perspective. And I think he's going to be good going forward. I just don't buy into the efficiency. So recent shooting numbers for Scotty Barnes, he has shot this year 11 of 17, 6 of 12, 6 of 8, 8 of 17, 9 of 14. It's not like he has a massively high usage rate. It's still only around 21%. So I look at his price point at 6,000, and I think that it's a fair play. Uh, I haven't projected a little over 30 fantasy points. but I wasn't necessarily dying to get to him. Same thing looking at OG Ananobi, where he's at 6,900. I think that is a reasonable price tag. And the other one he said was Gary Trent. Gary Trent has a 4,600 price tag. I don't think any of them are terrible plays, but these aren't guys that I'm necessarily dying to play in cash games. Do you view any of, of Gary Trent, Scotty Barnes, or OG Ananobi differently? Not, I, I mean, a little, 
they're they're reasonably optimal plays, particularly Ananobi and Trent on the DK slate, a little bit less so for Scotty Bournes. They're not guys I'd be going out of my way for by any means. Based on the optimal rate, I can justify getting to them. So if somebody's in love with the plays and thinks that they see something and that's the tiebreaker, then sure. But for me, they weren't really coming up. They were just kind of rendered uh, a little bit less effective than some of the other plays based on like OG is at 7,400 on FanDuel, 6,900 on DK now. There were better small forward and power forward plays on the DK slate than that, better uh, shooting guard and small forward on the FanDuel slate. So I just wasn't getting there. And then I totally agree with what you said about Barnes. What concerns me about him, 596 true shooting percentage for the year, only a 9.9% assist share and an 11.4% rebounding percentage. So he's not doing a lot else on the court. So when that shot starts not going down, that immediately becomes a negative play. So I would be concerned about that one uh, out of the three the most. But yeah, none of them really for me. All right, so let's jump back over to prize picks. Once again, if anybody's sticking around and listening has any questions about prize picks or in premium discord and has any kinds of questions about your lineups or whatever, we could certainly hit those as well. But uh, Terry, why don't you jump back over to the player props tool and tell me some of the player props that we have projected to have the best expected win rate and we'll compare them to the numbers that we have over on prize picks. All right, let's do it. Let's get in here and we will look to... uh, What do we think about... Donovan Mitchell with a 26 and a half points. All right. So Donovan Mitchell, he has a 25 and a half is his points over on prize picks. What do I have him for? Um, I like the under 25 and a half personally for this matchup against the Chicago Bulls. Uh, the, the pace of play in this game could potentially be a little bit of an issue, only a 218 and a half total. Although actually a lot of the games across the board are, are kind of lower totals. I don't know if you've noticed this this year, but with the change in the free throw rules, scoring is way down in the NBA this year. This is on pace to be the season that has the least amount of free throws ever attempted, even going back to the older days. People go, oh, the refs let everything play back in the day. Uh, we're looking at even less free throw attempts by a fairly significant margin compared to those games. So scoring down across the board, and it's definitely impacted Donovan Mitchell a little bit. His points output so far this year, 16, 27, 22, 15. Uh, so I actually like the under here for Donovan Mitchell. I'm going a couple points under than that, but... How do you how do you feel about under 25 and a half points for Mitchell? Yeah, it was at the, the 26 and a half uh, market. It was a obviously a little bit better on the under. It was a 71 percent win rate. So with that coming down by a point on the prize picks, figure you, you lose a little bit of the win percentage there. But I agree with everything you said about uh, the, the way in which he scores some of his points. Definitely taking a little bit of a hit tonight. So, yeah, I think the under makes some sense, even coming down by a point there. Figure it's going to be in the mid 60s uh, in terms of the win rate. All right, uh, hit me with another one. What else? What else are we looking at as a good prop? And by the way, guys, also any of these numbers you like here, head on over to Prize Picks, and you can use that promo code Awesome. You'll get a one hundred dollar bonus on your first deposit to start building your bankroll. And there's a couple of different ways to play the player props over on Prize Picks, where you don't actually you could parlay them together and don't have to hit all of them for it to return a profit. If you make a flex play and and pick three props, as long as you go two of three, you still get a positive return on that. Uh, then there's also the uh, the power play where that'll get you even bigger bonus, where if you go three of three, you get five X your return. But uh, hit me with another one, Terry. What's something else that projects really well for us? So I don't think this one's on uh, prize picks, unfortunately. I was just looking at Pat Connaughton with a uh, over on the five and a half rebounds, I think is, is somewhat interesting, but it looks like he's not on the prize picks unless I missed it. Um, so taking a look, let's talk about uh, John Morant and a five and a half uh, rebound, re- uh, rebound line for John Morant. Uh, it is five over at prize picks, so a little bit lower. Okay. All right. So Alex had it as a 73% uh, win rate on the under at five and a half. I still like that one as an under, even at five. I think, again, it, it'll come down by a couple percentage points in terms of the overall win rate, but figure it's going to be high 60s-ish. Um, so I think that one makes some sense. Looking at Ja, he's a guy with a 7.2% rebounding share on that team. So I don't necessarily think that we have to uh, really sweat that line. So uh, that's one that I like. I think five is really fair. That's right around what I have from. There's also something to be concerned with. I mean, Moran is playing so many minutes this year, just gives him so many opportunities to pull down rebounds. So he's averaging 5.4 rebounds so far this, this year. He's gone for seven rebounds and nine rebounds in each of the last two games. He's played as many as 42 minutes recently. So it, it's hard for me to look at somebody who's playing that many minutes and is so athletic with such a low total at five and feel great about it. You need him to get four or less for it to actually win. So 
Uh, that's going to be a fade for me in Moran. But once again, the sportsbook number a little different at five and a half. That could potentially make me feel differently, but not at the five. Uh, look up, look up another number for me there, Terry. All righty, let's see what we got here. Uh, jump over to the uh, to the assists board here, real quick. I'm uh, just trying to find some guys who are in games that have not started yet. Um, that's uh, what do we think of? Oh, jeez. Michael Porter Jr. is a guy that we talked about. It's a low line because he's not a big assist guy. One and a half assists for Michael Porter Jr. Same number over at prize picks, one and a half. Okay. So we've got him going under 74% of the time, which I think makes some sense based on what we've said about, uh, you know, he's a, a scorer primarily. We saw where the assist numbers were for him. Um, you know, so we, it was a little bit of an uptick. If I remember correctly, when we talked about him last weekend, we talked about, you know, maybe he's learning a little bit from playing with guys like uh, Jokic and guys like Aaron Gordon, who were willing passers. But I think on this, uh, on what I'm seeing here on the board from Alex, I think that's one that uh, I'm comfortable with saying the under. All right. I have that projected to go a decent amount over that number. Okay. So, uh, so far this year, assists per game for Michael Porter Jr. He's gone over that mark in three of five games. He's averaging over two assists per game this year, averaging 2.2. Uh, and then also it's a situation where you look at some of the minutes for Michael Porter Jr. I think there's reason to think they should go up going forward, which would also help his counting stat numbers. He's played 27 or, or less minutes in three of the last four games. And I think he's probably fairly likely to play over 30 minutes regularly going forward. So I actually have him project for nearly two and a half assists, considering an increase in assist rate so far this year. Also, that I think that the ball is going to have to be in his hands more, that there's no Jamal Murray in the mix. So I like the, I actually like the over here for Michael Porter Jr., although maybe not confident enough to put it in a, in a prop. But one and a half is such a low number. So I mean, to get one or less from him, I just don't think that happens all that frequently. All right, I like I like the analysis there, and no nothing to uh, to argue with about it there. It's uh, you know definitely, like I said, the assists share his percentage of their overall assists, not over ten percent, but like you said, he's gotten over two assists, uh, what three out of five times this year. So definitely, uh, you know, he's he's trending in that direction. So definitely a a, a coin flip, they want to call it. Uh, by the way, very odd start for Cade Cunningham, who is getting there with his fantasy points, but not quite in the way that maybe we would have expected. So Cade Cunningham in the first quarter, he has no assists. He is 0 for 4 from the field, but he has six rebounds. So you've huh. got six minutes and seven and a half fantasy points out of Cade Cunningham, which, hey, like I said, over a fantasy point per minute. He's still, on that, he's still on that track for over a fantasy point per minute. So if you're looking at 24 minutes from Cade Cunningham, we're you know, still looking at, like I said, that 26, 27 fantasy point marker. So, uh, but, but let's circle back to uh, prize picks. Let's look at some of the projections for players. And I want to specifically look at who are some of the more popular projected players today? And where do they look on prize picks? So how about a payoff option in Giannis and Tetsukumpo? What is his fantasy score total over at prize picks? So Giannis at prize picks has an over under of 54 fantasy points. I like the over on that quite a bit. Now keep in mind, Terry, prize pick scoring is the same over as there is over on FanDuel. I have Giannis projected for nearly 60 fantasy points today. So I'm well over that 54 point mark. How do you feel about Giannis? Yeah, I'm over the 54 point mark. Uh, my model, I've got him at 56 and a half. Alex has him uh, 55.7, and that's in 33.7 minutes. I'm using Alex's minutes tonight because it's just easier for me when I'm on shows. So we've got him right around the same. Both of us have him over that. You've got him over that. Uh, are you going a little higher than that on minutes if you're getting him up towards 60, or are we just doing things slightly differently that's projecting him up a little higher for you? Uh, I mean, he's just such a good fantasy producer. Yeah. So you look. At, so so far this year. Giannis is playing 31 minutes per game and averaging 57 and a half fantasy points. Uh, last year, he played 33 minutes per game, average 53. Uh, so obviously that's a little bit different. There's also a favorable matchup for him against the, uh, against the San Antonio Spurs. But then one other thing to also consider, if you're just looking at his numbers this year compared to last year, just in terms of points per minute basis, you have to figure he gets a boost because Dante DiVincenzo is out, Brooke Lopez is out, Drew Holiday is out, and Bobby Portis is out. So those are four guys who all play fairly substantial roles for the roles for the box and have big usage rates. So just based on that, you're then expecting that there's going to be potentially more playing time available to Giannis if the game stays competitive, but also more usage when he's on the court. So uh, with that kind of bump in usage rate, that's where I that's where I'm getting to Giannis project for nearly 60 fantasy points for me. 
Yeah, for sure. We're talking about a guy uh, who for the season is averaging a 34.3% usage rate and turning that into 1.85 fantasy points per minute with everything he does on the floor. And we're talking about that going up. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to get to one of the best players in the NBA, if not the best overall player in the NBA right now, uh, as much as you can in, uh, in basically all formats here. Any concerns within that, ju- just looking at the pace number for the Spurs, just a really, really slow pace team, uh, low, uh, low, low, um, overall uh, possessions per game figure it'll drag down Milwaukee just a little bit. Does that ding any of what you just said about Giannis? Or you just don't really care. It's still the highest total on the slate by a decent margin. So looking at all the games, that game has a total of uh, two twenty-three and a half. There's no other game on the slate with a total over two twenty. So, you know, we're still looking at a fairly substantial total relative to some of the other games we've seen so far. Milwaukee does play at the fastest pace in the league. And the, the Spurs actually are playing at a fast pace so far this year. Last year, they didn't play at a fast pace, but keep in mind, it was a different team. They had DeMar DeRozan on the court. So far this year, the Spurs are actually playing the sixth fastest pace in the league and the, and the Bucks are first. So I don't know if it really is a pace down spot. It's a small sample size, but based on a totally different look team from the Spurs this year, yeah, they, they look a lot different pace-wise. Okay. Yeah, I must have, uh, maybe I updated that wrong. I had them uh, as a pace down spot, but uh, I absolutely trust what you're saying there. It's also reasonable to look at because I, I never know exactly when to start transitioning some of the numbers from last year over to this yes, year. One, one thing that's always hard, especially, is when you're balancing any kind of projections in terms of, okay, is the matchup, you know, what can we expect from a boost from individual players and what teams do against that position? And obviously, four or five games doesn't really give us a whole lot of information, but then oftentimes we were just incorporating last year's data. The players could be totally different. So if you're looking at the Spurs, it's they had DeMar DeRozan last year and they don't this year, which is a totally different setup. But at least last year, the Spurs were 15th in the league in pace, so right around league average. But like I said, this year so far, they're playing sixth in the league in pace, which you know could maybe be a consequence of they no longer have DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan, mid-range shooter, one of the better half-court scorers in the NBA, but isn't necessarily somebody who's always pushing the pace. So uh, maybe him not being there is something that changes it. Uh, we yeah, only have and I actually one... figured out what was going on there because I was okay. doing it off of a, I was doing it off of a board that's apparently breaking the paste number down by uh, player. So I guess when the the players on the court and all of the Spurs were coming up with Bryn Forbes's pace number, which is a, a ninety three, which is not what they're playing at. So that's not in my model. Fortunately, it's just on my show dashboard. But I got to make that change. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> all right, by the way, a couple assists for Cade Cunningham to go around with all, with go along with all his rebounds. Jeez, so this guy, so yet yet to, to score a point though, but. We only got uh, we only got a few seconds left here, Terry. And let's just close out with this. Do you have any kind of closing thoughts on the slate, or anything you think people should be watching out for in the in the later slate of games? Uh, they should be watching out for my lineups rocketing to the top <laughs> with all the Dwayne Deadman I just laid up to. So let's go Heat. I am going to have an uncomfortable amount of the uh, primary players for the Heat. I think it makes a lot of sense if you're late swapping. You've still got a about uh, 10 seconds to get it in, I think, before uh, the 7.30 game starts. So uh, good luck to everybody out there. Uh, let's go Heat. Let's go Giannis. That's the fundamental parts of my lineup. Yep, that is going to do it for us today. Good luck today, guys. Let's go Dwayne Dedman. Let's go Heat.